Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for this workshop. We will start with a Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Mr. Otto. We will um, start this morning with Dr. Baker kicking us off. Dr. Baker. Thank you. I am really pleased to kick off this morning's workshop session. Um, today we're going to spend our morning talking about student outcomes. First with our research office director and chief academic officer kicking off a conversation that's really a look back conversation. It's an opportunity for us to further study the results from last year's um, student outcome monitoring, which was an attempt for staff to practice what it means to be monitoring student outcomes in a different way. And so we're here today to do our look back. Um, we also are going to hear about the experience of schools and some schools that have had incredible outlier results and an opportunity to hear the narrative and the story that goes with that and you'll hear um, Veronica Madrigal I'll talk more about that. Um, today's also an opportunity for you to practice as much as possible your student outcome focused monitoring questions and they're, they've been shared with you previously but I put another version of them at your place in case you want to be glancing at them um, as we further head into the discussion around goals and guardrails today for the board and have that conversation about our going forward opportunity related to monitoring student results. Um, paying special attention today to the relationships that you hear across departments and how departments support one another. We've had a, um, a minor reorganization in the district in service to student outcomes. That includes the development of a chief academic office that is in support and leadership of our level offices who supervise principals and think about the, the whole or the totality of a school and what a school needs, as well as the research office and thinking about school improvement and what schools, including principals and teachers, need to make sense of their data and to, to take action. Um, and so today is the beginning of hearing that conversation, maybe from a different perspective and thinking of how a chief academic office can be in service to what, what, what students and, and teachers need. That includes the Office of Curriculum under the Chief Academic Office and how assessment is then processed for teachers and for others to really activate upon. So I hope you'll listen with that new kind of new lens and be thinking about what you hear this morning between eight and 10, including the stories that will then lead into our discussion about goals and guardrails going forward. So we're gonna walk that line between our look back and our look forward together today before noon. All right, so I am pleased to pass off the baton in the room in this working session, this workshop session, to Brian Moskovitz. Thank you, Dr. Baker. A pleasure being here with all of you this morning. Really excited about um, not just looking at the data, but more specifically hearing from our schools. So we'll jump right to it so we can get to that. Um, as, as I thought about, and as I, in speaking with Veronica Madrigal, as we thought about uh, this morning, really wanted to center ourselves on this idea as we think about student focused governance. Hearing the conversation with A.J. Crabill last time, I, I, and he'll be joining us again later today, and thinking about how do we, we, we know that we have so much data that we can look at. We have so many outcomes that we continually look at, that we work with our schools to look at, and really take these deep dives across a, um, a number of metrics. But thinking about, and really thinking about what A.J. shared, is how do we, in this setting, really focus into a few key goals and really go deeper into that information, go deeper into that data. And so last year, you'll recall, not only did we have broad goals across, about student achievement, but we also were really centering our black African-American students. And in each of our district goals that we share with our schools, we were really asking our school leaders and our school teams to think about how are we going to center our black African-American students in our work? And how can we monitor data to see if we're making progress with that? And so in that vein, we're gonna do that today as well. We're gonna, the data that we're gonna be sharing, we'll look at some overall uh, student data, but we're also really going to center some data looking back to how our black African American students did last year as well. Um, you all received the kind of totality of data um, over the summer as part of the work with Dr. Baker and her evaluation process. So you have the data on how all students did and looking at all the various subgroups, um, but really to go deeper, as, as AJ would I think recommend, um, we narrowed into the data for 
all students and our black African American students. And then we're going to hear um, some stories from our school leaders related to that data as well. So that's our, our focus for today. And so I'm really happy to be able to invite uh, Veronica Madrigal, new director of research and school improvement to kick us off. Good morning, board president, Craighead board members, superintendent Baker, and senior staff, and of course, a broader LBUSD community that is watching today. And I wanna take this moment to thank my uh, team um, who is here today, who works hours analyzing the data, who um, prepared for this presentation, but more importantly, um, works with site leaders, staff, to hear their voices, to tell more about the story. Um, so I want to actually thank uh, Hamina Lilani and Dr. Jody Fender who are here with us. So thank you so much with their support and also other research team members that do this work. Um, I want to start out by just talking a little bit about data. Data usually is associated with um, a particular number, but behind the data, there is always a story. And as uh, Mr. Moskovich mentioned today, we're sharing um, end of year summary of targeted data for the 2022-23 school year. We want to also give voice to the story behind that data and each school will have a particularly different story, but what we wanna highlight is those positive outliers. What is it about their story that is different and what can we learn from that story? Information that we get from data um, is the compass that, we, that, that guides us. It tells us the direction to go, whether there are challenges, whether there are successes that we need to look at, the strengths of our students, our staff, and most importantly, the schools that are within those communities. So I ask you today to lean in and embark on this story that we're, be, we're going to start telling about our students and LBUSD. So let's start with the overview. Today we're going to start a little bit different and we're going to start with our high school. We're going to provide you with post-secondary readiness. We're going to look at grad and A through G rates, early indicators, ninth grade on track for A through G. And we're also looking at ninth grade eight, the ABC rates for core classes. For middle school, we're going to look at SBAC's uh, data, both in ELA and math. And then we're going to finish off with our elementary, looking at SBAC summative data, as well as our foundational reading skills. Because the goal is to look at the whole picture and see the trajectory of our students in LBUSD. So we begin with our high school. So what we have today is we're looking at post-secondary options. So we're looking at the class of 2023. And ultimately, the goal for our students is to graduate and meet the A through G requirements in order to have the option of attending a CSU or a UC. Our class of 2023 had a 83% graduation rate and 57% of the students met the A through G requirement, as you can see from the visual. Now, when we center our black students and we look specifically at that data, 80% of our black students graduated and 44% of our black students met the A through G um, requirements. So the story behind this data, and it's important to note is that this group of ninth graders were the most impacted because they were the group of students that started high school when the pandemic began. And so data has slightly declined, but it is comparable to other districts. But again, I want you to focus on the story behind the data. Now, Ms. Madrigal, just a quick sure. clarifying question. Um, all students is uh, everyone but black students. All students. All students. All students. Including black students. Including black students. Okay, thank you. So now let's take a look at ninth grade on track A through G. Now let's look at, when we look at track, um, the students who were on track, now ninth grade is a very critical grade because ninth grade data indicates whether our students are going to meet that A through G requirement. So the trend is showing that uh, we are increasing our ninth graders who are on track for meeting the A through G. Specifically when we look at our black students, um, when we look at our black students, we see an increase in terms of meeting the A through G at the end of ninth grade. And so passing classes with a C or higher in ninth grade is key to staying on track um, for meeting A through G. And again, this is um, data that we gather from class of 2023. 
And the next slide is going to give you, oops, let me go back. The next slide gives you a little bit more specific information around um, our students and those early indicators. So when we look more in depth at the ABC rate, we observe an increase in 2023, our ninth graders ABC rate. So that really means that what you're seeing is that you're seeing that all the lines are sloped upward and more so, more so for our black students. So that means that our students who took core classes such as English and math, um, they received an A, B, or C in terms of a grade. So we're seeing some positive trends in this area. Um, something to note is that depending on the student, sometimes students will take science, as you can see science is listed there, and then history may be an option for some students. But what we want to really have you focus on is the English as well as the math. Ms. Madrigal, may I add something? Sure. One of the things to, in terms of looking back, in case this is not just top of mind for you all, um, last year our district goals included in goal three, black student access to and success in A through G completion will increase at at least 5% beginning with the ninth grade cohort. And so just think about the precision of that focus in our high schools, in our expectations, because ninth grade, as Ms. Montegal stated, is a, is a leading indicator to A through G completion by the end of high school. And so um, this is an example of focusing on all students at, at high school level, but knowing that we need to be proactive and really think about that leading indicator of ninth grade in setting our goals so that there's focused attention on ninth grade. And so just when we're looking back, we see some decline in overall and black student graduation rates, but some very significant bright spots mm -hmm. in the areas of focus of leading indicator at the ninth grade year. So thank you for that feature. And thank you, Dr. Baker. That's a really nice transition to our next um, piece of information that I think this really is going to give you a different perspective as well as um, highlight a positive outlier. So what we wanted to do differently is share data, but also bring the folks in that make the data happen, that can tell you more about the story. And we wanted to, we, what we did is we gathered data around our high schools who had positive outliers. So today we have Principal Mona Merlot with her staff who will be joining us and she and her, the, her staff will be sharing what was it about their story, what did they do that perhaps others can lean in, gain some insight and implementation in terms of what we can do across our district. Hit the button. There you go, good morning. <clears throat> it is uh, it's great to be with you all this morning. Uh, my name is Lloyd Wilson, and I'm the vice principal, proud vice principal at Lakewood High School. And I, and I use that word proud because we're not where we want to be just yet, but we truly believe that we've done some things in the past two years that has um, served as a foundation for the transformation that we're looking to experience in the near future. The past two years, we've opened up our school with a theme of centering relationships, where we're not only talking about or, or uh, experiencing listening to students, but we want our staff to know our kids. And that's the reason why we think that we've experienced some, some growth in sense of belonging and, and some achievement areas. Now, I know you guys aren't here to listen to the adults, so we have two of our kiddos here with you um, that are gonna share their experience uh, in ninth grade at Lakewood High School. First one up is uh, JT. Hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeremiah Taylor, and uh, well, I first want to start off with uh, is my f uh, football like that that already oop, during the summer during the summer like even before going to Lakewood was it was already it was amazing you know starting off with football during the summer because that's when I met like my real friends before even coming into Lakewood like Winston right here you know he's one of my best friends uh, and then starting school of Lakewood uh, so it started off with having friends already from football my whole because our, our football community is, is, is great. You know, our coaches, they're great. 
the player is great you know it's it's great already and then uh starting off with uh my classes all my classes were amazing you know and i had a lot of friends in there from football and then also because i'm me so i can you know make friends and talk to people easy so that was that was really easy for me uh so i had a lot of good classes i had a lot of good friends and then i feel like uh becoming coming into a uh, high school or lakewood it's a really great experience and you know it's it's cool if if you just all you have to do is really you know be active and you know speak to people and you know like you know, don't care about like you know being afraid or anything you know you're really going to have a good time and a great experience in lakewood because you'll be just like me and have a good fun time you know so i think if you just be active, be talkative, and make some good staff friends too, because that's also amazing. Uh, and then you, yeah, you're gonna have a time of your life in Lakewood, honestly. Thank you. Yeah, the button pop. Hi. <coughs> Wait. Let me. Good morning. Um, my name is Winston Gardner. Um, as he said, football was great. We had great coaches and all, and. Uh, my classes were good. They were okay. I did struggle a little bit, but SSI helped me with the um, after school tutoring pro program. And I had a great time. I made a lot of friends and um, I stayed out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. And um, as long as you do your work and be on top of it, you'll have a great time. And I would like to thank all my teachers and peers for that. <clears throat> Thank you. Can I ask you, gentlemen, a, a quick question, if you don't mind? So you referenced some of the support from SSI and after school tutoring. Can you speak to some of the ways that teachers at Lakewood really supported you in making sure that you were passing your classes with the A, B, or C? Um, well, one of my teachers, Miss Walker, you know, now a vice principal at Lakewood, um, she pushed us to our limits literally like you know she made sure we was we stayed out of trouble we did our work and she was on us all the time if if, if we even had a c she made us go up to a b then to an a so yeah um miss bryant you know she helped a lot on on math and all the other things and each student teacher relationship was their own they had emotion a lot of focus and each one of us had our own little how can I say this um place yeah in their heart for the teacher there we go that's all I gotta yeah, say a little thing uh, I want to add is uh yeah Miss Brian like I ain't gonna lie, I was uh, struggling a little bit with some of my classes but I used to come uh, after school and then to Miss Brian class and she would help me you know get my grades up because I was you know down a little bit but then I got them up Ms. Bryan. <laughs> And Ms. Merlois, you're coming up. Maybe you can uh, share a little bit as well about the breakthrough success community work with our um, black students in ninth grade and, and your SSI work as well. Yes, so breakthrough success community is a core program where we work with other districts and really focusing on the ninth grade experience. And so we have what we call drivers and a small team that did PDSA cycles throughout the last three years technically. But last year we finally had a chance to really own the work because coming out of the pandemic we were pulled in many directions. So the work that we did last year, we dug into the grade books, we did a deep, deep dive into understanding what teachers are doing in their grade books, what it looks like visually on a 10 by 10 grid, and the impact of what they're doing, and how different it is, even within the same content area, but vastly different between two teachers. And so we're continuing that work as well this year. So I do believe that had a big impact on just getting everyone on the same page with grading, and so that an experience in one algebra classroom is comparable to the next algebra classroom. Um, the, that, and that was largely came through the Breakthrough Success community. We also streamlined our grade level teams so that truly when I have four teachers in a pathway at the ninth grade level, it's one English teacher, one science, one CTE, and one um, math teacher talking about the same kids. And so we had our first grade level team at a high school that, that is predominantly not the focus. 
We had the first meeting back in April or May to plant the seed for this year. Very well received. We put the teachers in their groups as they would be for this year in a team. And we had them visit different posters about how do you handle grading? How do you handle passes? How do you handle retakes? And it got them on the same page early. And so we're continuing that work. And it's, it's been probably the best received change by the teachers. It was a little resistant in the beginning, but now they, they realize the power behind it. And with that, we made some changes on campus simply in location. So for example, the ninth grade HOSUM team, including the co-teachers, are all in one hallway. So they see each other at each other's doors. They see the same kids rotating around. So it's truly the ideas of linked learning finally coming to life for, for real. Like we've been doing it, but we haven't been doing it the way we really know we can. So I think all of those pieces together. And then SSI, we're now three years in. And as these two gentlemen can attest, um, it's like having parents on campus. Uh, they're very much right on top of our students. And just seeing the growth um, from the freshman year to the 11th grade year already. And I have a question um, for JT and Winston. So are you currently freshmen or are you currently sophomores? Oh, we're sophomores. Sophomores, yeah. Oh, okay. So you're able to look back a little bit on your freshman year and the um, foundation it, uh, it laid for your subsequent years. And so we're, we're hearing about the, um, the relationships and the changes being made with the pathways and the teachers. And so are you feeling that? Are you feeling like, and, and Winston, you talked about how you have a teacher that's a little demanding. And, and what, do you, what do you think about that? Is that a, a welcome uh, behavior in your teachers? Oh yeah, you know. They always wanna make sure we are on top of our stuff have good grades and be the best we can be in their classes. And so you, it, it sounds like you see that as a way of the teachers caring for you. Yes, ma'am. Because yeah. they expect a lot. Yes, ma'am. And you know what, it's wonderful to see. I, I can see that in your face when you talk about that and, and I can see the benefit. And so I just wanna thank the teachers and, and staff for making that effort. And I know Ms. Merlot talked about how it's difficult to make those changes, but we see the benefit in that because of the way um, you are perceiving that, um, what we would call warm and demanding. That's what we like. We like warm and demanding because we want to feel that caring, but we also want to have high expectations for our students. Okay. Oh, Mr. Miller. Yeah, well, first off, thank you, uh, JT and Winston, for being here. Uh, as you guys probably heard before the meeting started, I'm a little bitter about football right now. My football team is uh, underperforming, and so uh, I'm a little, a little disappointed in watching football. Uh, still, go Chargers, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I noticed a couple of things, and I wanted to uh, maybe ask a little bit more from you all personally, but for, I want to preface it with a, a number of things. So when you talked about uh, your entry into high school and you talked about how you created uh, friendships and a community around the football team, I very much remember that. I can remember being and feeling, uh, in all honesty, maybe a little anxious because it was going to be a whole bunch of new kids, but uh, essentially some pre-adults that are going to be on my campus coming out of junior high and so building relationships uh on that football team uh we called it what was it uh the best ways to build relationships are through sweat tear and fear and football gives you pretty much all three right and so uh it's a great way to do so and then um when you were building on the football piece uh we also talked about, or we obviously were introduced to your vice principal here, which I think is also just another one of those catalysts in supporting our black students. Uh, and the sense that not only do you have someone 
who is there with the academic support component, but can culturally identify with some of the struggles that you may be dealing with on campus. Uh, uh, I too had that same benefit. I had an assistant principal. I talk about him all the time, Douglas Stewart, and he was fantastic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at Milliken. And, uh, all things considered, uh, he was uh, really a safe haven for a lot of our black students who were going through some tough times and um, were on the cusp that's that's the term I'm gonna that's the PC terms I, I'm gonna use is they were on the cusp and so having somebody uh, like this brother here is going to be a, a great resource for your students and I'm happy to see that we have uh, something like that on your campus but I'm gonna ask you to dig a little deeper here right so we talk about all of these opportunities to be successful right you have a uh, football family you have this great uh, infrastructural piece uh, to support. I'm curious to hear, mid-pandemic, what do you think was the subject that was the hardest for you to do from a computer screen without direct contact to a teacher, without this culture, without these students who are tangible and able to support? I'm just curious, which ones would you say, without going into too much detail, what do you think was probably the hardest subjects for you to? Uh, for me, I would say uh, try not to fall asleep, honestly. OK, OK, OK. That was pretty So long. attention span? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. OK. I would say getting to the Zoom on time. Oh, yeah. OK. Zoom. And like okay. knowing the correct times to get on and get off. Okay. Yeah. Also, there was a there was problems with the Zoom sometimes. In my thing, I don't even right. understand. So, right. yeah, and like and the ha the hackers and trolls and all right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, part two. Uh, from an academic standpoint, was there a certain subject like math, science, English that was probably the hardest for you to manage during the uh, your time when trying to learn through Zoom? Most definitely. <laughs> and which one was it? Would you say? I would say math. Math. You know? yeah. I would say ELA. Mm. 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 And with that said, knowing that those were subjects that were really difficult, now that you're on campus and you have these supports, what are things that you would say that now with now we're talking post-pandemic, things that you think are benefiting you that obviously you didn't get from the computer screen in those same subjects? Uh, uh, help. Okay. Yeah, Just help. The, the tangible body yeah. in there? Ms. Okay. Brian, Ms. Walker. Right. Uh, the the brick and help. mortar, right? Yeah. yeah. I was just like, oh, wait, wait, what are you saying? <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. He took my words. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, obviously, that was important for us as well. But I, I was definitely curious just about those pieces because that's exactly why we're here. We're not only wanting to take what you guys are let's just say naturally going to learn from an academic standpoint from going to school, but how do we help build upon those things and provide the uh, additional resources and support to help you reach the best versions of yourself. And so um, I appreciate you guys just sharing a little bit of what you got going on. You're welcome. Good morning, gentlemen. Appreciate Good morning. Your, morning. your comments this morning. So I'm going to approach the, the question a little bit differently. Um, I heard a few uh, things around how important it was for you to feel a part of something, community, Mr. Miller said. Um, and I heard you actually say it's important to be talkative, right, to reach out. So I'm wondering um, if you all are hearing or observing anything from your fellow students or from your friends that maybe aren't having such a great time or experiencing some challenges, if you could sort of speak to um, knowing that you've been actively you know, tr trying to talk, trying to be involved, trying to participate. Uh, what are some of the things that you're hearing or seeing from other students that are maybe not having as great a time or, or you're seeing you know, have some challenges or obstacles? Have, have you been seeing or hearing any of that? From your friends or, or students? I'll go first. Mm, for, for me personally, I haven't heard anything yet so far because it's still like the fourth week of school. Yeah. So yeah, I gotta go more. What into about from school. last from last year while you all were you know in, starting high school? Last year there were some people that wanted to like ditch all the time, and the people that wanted to go to class and get their work done. So it was a mix between both of them. Yeah. So, I have yeah. a couple of friends who they probably couldn't do this because you know they say they're too nervous and you know something like that so they don't want to you know be all active and stuff with talking to people yeah thank you mm -hmm. 
kind of a, a district question. Um, Were, was Lakewood picked uh, to do anything special or um, uh, did you do any added resources or is, is it still just decisions being made at, at each school as to how to handle these things, which I think is. Yeah, that's a great question, Ms. Rado. One of the things that was referenced was the Breakthrough <coughs> Success Community and that is among four of our high schools that participate. The Breakthrough Success Community yeah. is actually a research-oriented community that comes out of the work of core districts. And so what Ms. Merlot referenced is a strategic opportunity for some of our schools that Dr. Camarino and his team recently had available to all schools and had they were actually in the high school principal meeting last week presenting about ninth grade and that the factors that can be used to influence the success of students in the ninth grade year. So that was not completely unique to Lakewood but among one of the additional supports that was provided. And then you heard reference to the Student Success Initiative, which has been built in the high school office with a team that Dr. Camarino can, can talk about. And that is part of our learning acceleration and support plan that has three specific pillars to it to provide academic supports and social emotional supports. And then some of the um, teachers following up, as was described by our students, um, <laughs> following up with them to ensure that even if they're at the level of a C, that they, they bump their grade up. And so that is a program, the way that we talk about programs, that is in its third year um, with use of our ESSER money to really test if that works or what, what we would need to continue to maintain if we see results coming from it, which you've heard some about. So academic, social, emotional, and, what, and the third one is what? Of the, of the Student Success Initiative yeah. is actually leadership. Okay. And really working with students around the skills of leadership. Yeah. <coughs> Dr. K oh, go ahead. Yeah. And are there additional resources that, uh, how does that work? And are they picked by the school so that something happens at Lakewood that might, for different reasons, happen? You, you would do something different at another school? Yeah. So I'll ask Ms. Merlot to speak to anything that is separate from district. The, the two things that I named are district funded. And mm -hmm. one is for some schools, the Breakthrough Success Community is for a small group of schools right now that Dr. Cameron is looking to expand. The Student Success Initiative is active in all of our high schools right now mm -hmm. um, and is led by Dr. Marco Atkins Jackson, who I think is somewhere behind me. And then I'll just um, offer to Ms. Merlot to add anything that has been really specific. Link learning is district implementation, but schools have some discretion over how they implement and some of the things that Ms. Merlot referenced previously are ways that they have really looked at their own data and their own link learning programming and worked as a teacher and administrative team to think about the needs of their schools. So build, build on that. So uh, within the link learning pathways, some of our pathways, the science class also counts as a CTE class. Mm -hmm. So this opens up another period of the day where we need to fill the student schedule. So Odyssey, which JT is in, uh, does digital literacy for college and career readiness. And I have an amazing teacher teaching it, so that's always beneficial. But what we learned is that the Odyssey uh, pathway actually had the higher ABC rate out of all the pathways and really thinking that this class really was a significant part of that. And so we've expanded that now. Uh, the Merit 101 is now doing digital literacy, and we've identified additional ninth and 10th graders across all the pathways that kind of fit a certain um, profile, if you will. Students who are basically attending, the attendance is good, the grades maybe are not as good, but um, the credits are there. Like one student I literally came across had a 1.0 GPA, but 35 credits which tells me the kid knows just to, to, to do just enough. And maybe with that extra support during the day, would get to that ABC level. So we have 264 students this year in ninth and 10th grade participating in the college and career, the digital, digital literacy for college and career readiness. Of those students, we have a seventh period with Dr. Williams, specifically targeted African-American males, ninth and 10th grade, a couple of juniors, and we're partnering with um, Building Bridges Foundation. And they come in every other week and work with the students during the class period and mentoring them. They'll be taking them on field trips and building another sense of community among our African-American males. Mm -hmm. so, and that's just one of the examples of where we have some flexibility. 
That's great. And we could obviously take a much deeper dive with, we could probably have Lakewood here for a couple of hours sharing. <laughs> but I do want to um, ask Dr. Camarino if there's anything either you heard that you could share is kind of um, what we're trying to do to take these positive outliers and share some of these best practices across the entire division. Thank you. And I just want to say, gentlemen, very, very proud of you. It's very brave to be up here speaking in front of the board and district staff and on camera. I mean, you can't see them, but they're around you here. Um, <laughs> but instead of me answering that question, I really want to ask you guys to answer the question as to how did you feel before you came to Lakewood? And then as you look around the room and you see Mr. Turner, you, you see Ms. Bryant, you see Mr. Wilson, you see Ms. Merlot, how do you feel when you're walking around campus, right? What did you feel like before you came on campus? And what was different when you see them around, when the bell's about to ring or you're walking around at lunchtime? How do you feel when you're a community, of, specifically of African-American students, coming to Lakewood? Um, well, feeling coming to Lakewood before we went to Lakewood? Well, I, d I, had, I had a brother who went here, uh, to went to Lakewood, so, you know, and then sometimes when I would come, you know, come, bef like, say I had to use the bathroom or anything, you know, he would show me. Uh, Lakewood and then since I was gonna go there sometimes he would just show me around or saying, saying like this is this building or this is you know what's here so I was already excited to come to the thing especially being my brother for about like a year so that was already cool for me and then what like seeing the staff around campus uh honestly like seeing them around campus I'll me personally I'll just you know go say what's up to them because they always cool to me so you know I go say what's up to all all my staff that I know so I like I like I like to say say what's up with him, talk to him a little bit, then you know before I head to class or something like that. Before I came to Lakewood High School, I was a kid. <laughs> Let's say that. <laughs> then when I got to Lakewood, I felt welcome walk, walking around because I knew I had support. And whenever I see one of my fellow teachers and staff, I would always. Um, Either give them a hug or shake shake their hand and talk to them for sure, you know. Check um check up on them, you know, and stuff. And yeah, oh, I did have a older brother that went to Lakewood as well, you know. He's like one of the reasons I came to Lakewood High School, and uh, that's about it. All right, let's give our Lakewood team a round of applause. Thank you for being here. All right, Miss Madrigal. And before they walk away, I do want to quantify their data. So Lakewood achieved a 7% higher graduation rate for all students, which means that 90% um, overall students graduated, as well for black students. Uh, black students, which it was 80% of our black students at Lakewood graduated compared to 80% for the district. So that's a huge positive outlier. Can you say that one more time, Ms. Madrigal? Sure. So Lakewood achieved a 7% higher graduation rate for all students, which it amounts to overall 90%, as well as for black students, 87% um, for Lakewood High School compared to 80 uh, overall for the district. Thank you. So let's continue on our journey, and we're now moving on to our middle school. So we're going to spend some time looking at middle school SBAC data. So the transition to middle school, we want to make sure that we look at the SBAC data. There was a little, there was little change overall in SBAC percent of students who met or exceeded standards in reading and math for each grade level. Uh, the percent of students meeting or exceeding standards in 20 to 23 declined slightly in reading, however, remained consistently higher in math, as you can see, for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. And also with our SBAC data in middle school, we did have a positive outlier in this data, specifically around our black students. So I'm going to ask that our um, middle school led by Principal Dal Lawson come on up and that middle school is Stanford Middle School All right, thank you for for having us here. Um, thank you for the callback to uh, Doug Stewart 
uh, that, that brought out some feels with me. I had an opportunity to work with him, and what a great man he was. Um, I want to thank you all for allowing us to, to speak at something like this. M myself and Mr. Waddles were super proud to be at Stanford. And I think even more than that, we're, we're proud to be Long Beach Unified School District. Uh, we work in a district, as you all know, and I'm just repeating what I think we all know, uh, that values uh, student voice, that values uh, equality, that values you know us really looking at data to move students forward and building relationships, because I, I believe there's a nexus in there. Um, at, at Stanford, we're very fortunate um, you know, to have a great staff. It's a large school. One thing that we have worked at at Stanford is uh, uh, with the uh, understandings continuum is U3. So last year, we really worked on student engagement, student agency, and student voice. And inside of all of that, um, the relationships that can be built, built inside of that. So I, I, I'm going to get my phone out real quick. I don't have this in memory, so give me a moment here. Um, when I got to uh, Stanford, we were taken through a process at the time by um, uh, Dr. Lund, uh, an equity inquiry question. Where are we at? What do we need to do for those, uh, for those students that, uh, that need it? And so what we came up with was uh, what opportunities are our most marginalized students, African Americans, Latinas, Latinos, our Latinx population, given to collaboratively work on authentic challenges, questions, and projects? really defined and honed in on what can we do to meet their needs. Uh, and that's going to be a question that we're going to continue this year. Um, I'm a believer that uh, you set goals, but you don't turn the page, you expand the book. Uh, so I think that we want to continue that good work, and I think we'll look at a little bit of our outcomes in a little bit. But we had trainings at uh, staff trainings where we brought our staff in and we had um, kind of voices from the field, which is what we're kind of doing right now, where we had um, our black African-American uh, students uh, with quotes anonymously, you know, quotes about their teachers, uh, not specifically, but, but what was happening in the classroom, what their needs are, where we were going. And it was super, super powerful and super uncomfortable for some people as well. And out of uncomfortability, inside that word is comfortability, right? Is being comfortable. But you got to get uncomfortable to really move. So uh, what was great about that is we gave uh, our teachers an understanding to be self-reflective of where they are. And there's a really interesting uh, term or quote that we hear all the time is meet students where they're at, right? And, and that's wonderful. And I would say that we try to do that. But I would argue that taking them with you where you're going is paramount to that. So meeting them where they're at is great, but how about guiding them to where we want to go? And so that's something that we've uh, tried to do at, at our school. And then I'm going to kind of expound on our culture at uh, Stanford. We have brought in restorative justice. Um, I had the opportunity this summer to put a suit on and come speak in front of all of you uh, for a, a different reason. But, but I got a chance to kind of touch on restorative justice as it applies to, um, you know, you're going to hear me say this word or this phrase a lot, coexisting with students. So we use restorative justice at our school, um, really with safe and civil, but restorative justice is a big, big piece to what we do at uh, Stanford, and it was done prior to me getting there. So I also want to be very clear that this is years of work. This isn't uh, Dow Lawson came to Stanford and I have some kind of secret sauce. That's, that's not what's happening. It's continuing the work of my predecessor uh, and, and looking at where we are right then and there. And so with restorative justice, we were uh, given some monies to train more of our staff. We have two thirds of our staff trained in restorative practices. And for those that don't know RJ, and I, I won't bore you with too much, but I do want to say that there's a couple different ways to look at restorative justice. And, and circles are one way you'll hear that tag word a lot, that you run circles at your school. Uh, there's a couple different types of circles that can be run. There is um, relationship building, so community building circles. At any time on Stanford's campus, if you're up there, you'll see uh, either in the classroom or out uh, in a grass area, the students have brought their chairs out and we're doing community circles where they get to know one another. They build relationships with one another and they certainly build relationships with their instructors, their teachers. Um, those are important circles and those are great to do and we do those with our staff as well and that's important to bring us together. But at times things happen. It's a school. You have fights, you have disagreements, things of that nature. And inside of that phrase restorative justice is that restorative piece because justice by itself has different definitions for all of us 
right? And, and it's a loaded word. It just is. What is justice to one person isn't to another. But restorative justice is mending, and again, that, that phrase coexisting. And that's what we have pushed. Uh, and so when we do have these disagreements, fights on campus, things of that nature between students, that circle is called a harm and conflict circle, which is run which really uncovers, uh, under the guidance of a, of a teacher or faculty member, what happened during that time. How can we, again, that phrase, coexist with one another and the students interact with one another and kind of face where they've been, where they're going, and where they want to be uh, in terms of their relationship on campus. The campus isn't going to change. There's no hiding spots. There's no place where, you know, we're going to move your class to here and move your class to there because you, you didn't get along for a moment. We're going to help those students to mend fences, to get along, to, to foster that friendship or relationship. It may never be a friendship again. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is that coexist piece. So um, those harm and conflict circles happen. We're also very lucky. Uh, we took some of our monies, our LCFF monies, and um, we have a group of teachers that um, are part of those that were trained that have uh, that use their conference period we pay them during their conference period to run circles when needed so we will let them know you know what we've got two students that want to do a circle that want to enter in on that and some students don't want to do it you ask them and they say i'm not ready to do that yet there's anger there or there's resentment there's fear there's there's sadness but when they're ready to do that, we set those up. And if we're not running them ourselves, we build capacity by having our teachers that are trained do them. This is super powerful because they also build that relationship with that teacher as well. So um, inside of all of that, RJ is incredibly important. That's our abbreviation, Restorative Justice, at our site. And uh, it is part of our culture. And it certainly moved us forward where we are at uh, Stanford. Um, again, I'm super proud of that work. I want to continue that work. Uh, and I wanted to, before we, we, we go any further, and before I hand it off to uh, Mr. Waddles, who's fantastic, um, we also, um, I, I think it's really important to note that, uh, that our anti-racism club, which he'll talk about in a little bit, did a phenomenal training in front of our staff. Again, uncomfortable and wonderful in that uncomfortability um, because I think we all came out of that better. I wanted to kind of, as I hand it off to him, I want to let you know that what's coming for us. So Stanford, Marshall, under the guidance of um, Mr. Steinhauser, and uh, Alejandro Vega at Milliken, we are forming a collaboration. Uh, we're actually having our initial meeting next week. There's a nexus between all three of our schools because school of choice is, is, is in and of itself something, right? But many of our students go on to Milliken or go on, you know, or Marshall kids go on to Milliken. We really want to do right by our black African-American families and build those communities up in our area. And I think that this is something, again, this is uh, Mr. Vega who came up with this and approached myself and Mr. Steinhauser, and I'm like, where do I sign up? So we have a meeting next week, um, and we have something at our school, the Emoja Club also, that, 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 that meets the needs of our students. But if we're not looking at a broader a broader spectrum, a broader picture of it, then I'm not sure we're doing our job. So I think that's something that's to come. I can't wait. I'd love to come back and let you know uh, with my peers, with Mr. Steinhauser and with uh, Mr. Vega and share some of our outcomes from that as well. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Waddles, who's uh, just awesome. I can't say enough. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name's Hank Waddles. I've been teaching in the district for uh, long enough to have taught some of your children. Um, uh, this is my 33rd year. I've been at Stanford for, uh, this is my, my 13th year, I believe, um, at Stanford. And, uh, you know, I've approached this work uh, as I was an English major in school, and I've been teaching English for my whole life. And, and so I firmly believe that we can find the answers to our problems within the pages of a book, uh, especially if we're if we're all reading that same book and, and talking about it. and And I think that some of what we've what we've accomplished at Stanford, uh, you know, like Dow mentioned, it's it's uh, everything everything that we do is connected. and And so, uh, you know, I feel like when when um, when the district really began pushing this need for equity and identity and, and, and you know, diversity and inclusion, uh, I really feel like at Stanford we were already going. Um, and, and so uh, kind of 
what some of that looked like was um, uh, book discussion groups amongst our amongst our faculty and staff. And uh, I think you know we we read uh, four different titles, and we it was you know we had a core group of teachers, but there were lots of teachers who came who came in and out. And so um, I, I, my guess is that half to maybe a little bit more than half of our teachers participated in some uh, in some respect. And uh, really, I think. There was some there was some eye opening. We talked about um, about being uncomfortable. There were for sure some teachers who were uncomfortable in some of those conversations, um, and uh, you know things that some of us take for granted uh, was new for other people. And I remember times when I would go home uh, to my wife after a um, after a, one of these meetings, and someone had uh, you know had some realization, and I. I I said to my wife, so sometimes I feel like I'm watching people discover gravity, right? This is something that, that, that I've been living with and that, that it's not a reality for, for everyone. And, and so that understanding then, um, you know, kind of trickles through the faculty, which, which begins to kind of change the, uh, change the, the, the culture of the school, or um, it allows the culture to change. Maybe it's a little bit better. Uh, and so going back to, you know, so we were doing that, that reading, um, and right before the pandemic, I started a book club on campus, um, uh, Stanford Project Lit, and the goal of the goal of it is to uh, all of the books that that I choose to read, uh, they're all from underrepresented authors writing about underrepresented characters, uh, dealing with uh, dealing with themes of of identity of inclusion, uh, um, and. What that has allowed me to do, you know, like Dow mentioned that we, you know, we have affinity groups on campus, and there's a there's a value and a strength to, to that, correct? Um, but there's also, you know, we are all so interconnected, right? And um, and so, what I've been able to do by by selecting um, by selecting titles not out of a hat but out of need, and uh, understanding that um, by, you know. We have a hard time in this country speaking about race, um, but the children do not. The children do not, and they they embrace these conversations. And so, for example, after um, you know, we I started the book club right before the pandemic, and it was so successful that uh, my students actually came to me and asked if we could still continue. Um, uh, you know, and so we we were on Zoom and we were doing these meetings and um, and. Uh, after after George Floyd was killed, um, you know, I was able to. It's hard to have that conversation with a twelve year old, um, and but so instead, you know, we I chose I chose a book, this book right here, Ghost Boys by Jewel Parker Rhodes. Which, um, if there's a middle schooler in your life, uh, put this book in their hands, please. Um, it's it it, it's, it was a way for us to have a conversation about about police violence uh, towards towards black men towards towards black boys, and and it was some of the most powerful moments of my teaching career. Really came from the conversations that we had in uh, in the, in these meetings, uh, and then what's great about that is that is that these books have now become um, are, are now coming into the district curriculum, right? And so, uh, so, so again, like these books are changing what we do at Stanford, but also what we do in the district. Um, and, and the other thing is, as an English teacher, I was seeing evidence of this in my classroom where students, you know, students who are in this book club were then, you know, they've read such and such book, and then they're bringing those conversations into, into discussion of the other literature that, that we're reading, right? So it's supporting what, what you know, what we're doing in, in the English classroom. Um, and, you know, then extending from that um, was the, uh, uh, the anti-racism club that I started. Um, and uh, I came across, again, I came across another book because this is where the answers are. Um, this book is anti-racist, and this is a this is a uh, by Tiffany Jewell. This is a, a a genius book aimed at middle school kids. And uh, so, if if you think about this, like I had a club on Fridays after school on Fridays when most kids were walking to Starbucks uh, or someplace, and I had a group of kids who came to my room every day uh, to read and to discuss. And we you know we would do a chapter each Friday. And what that what that forum allowed was um, 
you know, there's lots of history. I mean, because these kids are, these kids tend to be, they're sheltered because they're 12, right? And so, so they're learning about lots of history of, um, of diversity challenges. And, and then it allows them to see what's in front of them. It allows them to, it gives them a language to speak about what's, uh, what's happening. And, and again, by, um, you know, both of these groups, as you can imagine, there's a strong overlap between, between uh, Project Lit and between my anti-racism club. Um, but they're, they're, those groups are very diverse. And so what happens is they're, they're, again, like I said, it's easy for them to talk to each other about their own experiences. And, and so when we would have someone, you know, we talk about, well, you know, in, you know, in my black community, here's one issue that we deal with. And so it says, well, you know, that reminds me because, uh, you know, because, you know, I'm from the Philippines and in the Philippines, there's this, this, this different beauty standard that's a little bit different from what you're talking about. And so by understanding those commonalities between the, um, you know, the, the commonalities of oppression, the commonalities of, uh, of, of what we're striving for, it, it really kind of increased this community. Um, and then the most beautiful thing about that is that, again, um, I saw evidence of these conversations that we had on Friday afternoons would then, would then come into the classroom. And so when we're reading texts like, uh, like Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, which is one of the eighth grade core novels, or when we're, when we're, when we're reading Farewell to Manzanar again, uh, the students that I have in those clubs are pushing the conversation forward because they're raising their hand and they're talking about things like internalized racism and they're talking about, uh, about things, um, you know, like the interconnectedness of all of these things. And, um, and so it's just, it's been a really, powerful experience um, and I know that these things are 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 spreading you know uh, project lit is we're kind of in process of, of spreading that to the other middle schools and k-8 schools uh, I, I know that graduates of my anti-racism club have, are now at, at poly high school and just this week they started um, they start they started they started their branch of this club at Poly, and so um, I can tell you. I mean, like I said, I've been teaching for for 33 years. Um, I believe that I'm good at what I do. When I'm done, um, these this, these are probably the two things that I will be most proud of: is is uh, is the anti-racism club and Project Lit. Uh, because I see a sometimes in education, you know, we don't see you know we don't see the fruit of our labor until until years down the road, um, especially for, for middle school teachers, right? Uh, but in this case, um, you know, they talk about, you know, it's a wise man who, a wise man plants trees, the shade of which he will never enjoy. Uh, these trees grow fast, and I'm standing in the shade of these trees. And it's, um, so it's been a really great thing. So that's all I've got. Thank you for... Uh, Well, I know from experience because um, you taught the son of one of my best friends, and I know from Nicholas. experience that you are highly regarded from a student's point of view. I know that you keep in contact with your students well after they've left you at Stanford, and what you're doing is so valuable, and we are so fortunate to have you um, with us this morning. and letting us know what you're doing in these uh, extracurricular activities with your Project Lit, your Anti-Racist Club. And by uplifting your story today, we are encouraging other teachers to do the same. I appreciate how, um, I don't know, if it's, the, if, if it's the confidence in what you're doing, but I believe you're in the right place and doing the right thing. It's, it's very inspiring. And so thank you so much um, for being here with us. Um, thank you. Dr. Benitez. Mr. Waddles, Mr. Lawson, um, you've given us a lot to think about uh, here. Um, but Mr. Waddles, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you if, if you can sort of walk us through this uh, discovering gravity. Uh, reference that you made because oftentimes what we hear from our black students um, and even before our board uh, meetings and from our students of color um, is the importance of being valued of being seen of being heard of being acknowledged of being celebrated 
And um, what we're really talking about uh, as a system is a disparity of opportunities and disparities of experiences. Um, and so uh, both of you, uh, you know, Dow, we've known each other for six, seven years now, uh, but both of you um, started with the importance of lifting up the student voice and centering the student voice and what that leads to. In spite of gravity, trees grow faster, uh, right, when, when we center students in, in meaningful, authentic, and concrete uh, ways. So um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, um, because I think, uh, as President Craig had said, um, this is not, uh, there's no magic sauce to this. There's no magic wand. These are things that we can take from encouraging teachers and recommending to doing it by policy and practice, uh, right? To requiring what it's taken you 33 years, uh, Mr. Waddles, to individually, uh, and I would say unfairly carry some individual burden uh, in this, in spite of our system, in spite of national discourse, in spite of things that we have no control over, you've, you've taken on the challenge in some ways as an individual. So, I, so I'd like to hear you both speak to um, what does this look like then from a district perspective, uh, given your experience, uh, given that, uh, at least for you, Mr. Uh, Lawson, I know that you've been at multiple schools, Mr. Waddles, I'm, I'm not sure if you've been at Stanford the whole uh, time, um, but w w what does what you talk about look like from a, from a system perspective if at the end of the day our goal here is to improve, yes, student experience, student engagement, but student outcomes, right? We have a disparity around student achievement, student outcomes, and, and the importance to which you both spoke to, whether it's restorative practices, whether it's a, a, a book club, a reading club, really what we're looking for is for that to translate into student outcomes in the classroom year by year, but, but then on a scale. So could you talk a little bit more about this, even if it's anecdotal, how we take this, and, I, and I'm hesitant to say scale, because this is, this is school by school, community by community, classroom to classroom, but how we take the approach, the intentionality, the values uh, with which you're both speaking to, and, and think through student, the student outcomes and student impact piece. Um, yeah, I got a couple things. Um, so first, first thing that struck me as you're speaking is you mentioned something ab about my um, uh, carrying an, uh, an unfair weight, um, and you know, there's a there's a lot of ways that you can that you can do this job, um, and and I've been intentional in the way that I've chosen to do it, and uh, um, uh, because I, I believe that we have. A moral imperative to to uh, to reach our students, and the way that I choose to do it um, is by many times by putting a book in a child's hands because this is uh, because this is my love, right? Um, uh, but you know, and you mentioned that I that I keep in touch with students. I, I do keep in touch with students because because um, like I tell kids all the time, like like I love all aspects of my job. Uh, I love the literature. I love talking about writing. But more than any of that, I love my students. And I tell them that. And um, and the best part of my job is, um, like I said, I love every single day. But the best part of my job comes uh, on a Saturday afternoon when I'm in Target and and I run into a former student. Right. And, and I can have a conversation about what they're doing. And then I can see, I can selfishly, I can see the impact of, uh, of, you know, that I've had on this, on this child. And, and so, um, this is, this is, there's nothing unfair about what I'm, about what I'm doing. And I know that you didn't mean it in that, in that sense, but, um, I can't, I could not imagine doing this job a different way. Right. And so, and as far as how do we scale this, uh, you know, people often talk about, and, and I think that uh, people often say that, you know, change has to come from the top, right? And, and I strongly, strongly disagree with that. Uh, change is bottom up. It has to be bottom up. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, and, and I, 
and I mean no disrespect when I say this uh, because I'm a part of it as well. Uh, it's difficult sometimes for us to uh, to remember our prior experience, right? And so um, if you talk to any teacher anywhere, they'll tell you that when uh, when someone moves out of the classroom and into administration, they quickly forget some of the day-to-day realities of that job, right? The same way when uh, that I as a teacher uh, or, or we as parents, we quickly forget the day-to-day realities of being a child, being a student. And so uh, we talk about that all the time. We need to listen to those people, you know, who are, um, you know, who have not yet risen to our level of experience, right? And so, like, uh, like Dow mentioned, one of the most powerful things that we did with my anti-racism club was, um, b- because I mentioned before that Stanford was, was, I feel like we were ahead of the rest of the district in terms of the work we were doing. Um, but, you know, those of us who are, who are in this fight um, know that there's, that there's a fatigue uh, that, that sets in, right? Uh, and after George Floyd, everyone was, everyone was an ally. And, but that quickly dried up, right? People get tired of that. And so we were facing that on our campus. Um, and so we realized that we needed to hear student voices. And so um, my anti-racism kids had presented to uh, a panel of uh, Long Beach State students um, and professors, and they did such a phenomenal job that I, I came to Dow the next day and said, we need to, I mean, they need to speak to our faculty. And he said, yeah, like, here's the meeting, let's do it. And, you know, watching these four young girls stand up and not just speak to adults, but speak to adults uh, who held their grades in the in their hands, right, um, uh, was one of the bravest things that I've seen. And so many people on staff were maybe tired of hearing my voice or tired of hearing Dow's voice on these same issues, but more of them listened to these to these kids. And and I think that that that's the way that we scale this by by empowering teachers to empower students, and because that's where the that's where the, the change has to come. And so and I and I know as a as a as a teacher, I can't wait for for instance, uh, I can't wait for the district curriculum to change. I have to I have to ask people to change it, which is what I've done here, which is why we have which is why we have these novels. Um, you know, in the classroom today because of what we started, you know, four years ago. If I may, Dr. Lund, maybe you can join in. I know that, so of course, Dr. Lund um, led our middle schools for the last several years, is now in the Office of Curriculum Instruction and Professional Development. Can you, Dr. Lund, just share a little bit about um, some of the work even going on recently in the unit guides, bringing in text, and maybe what you've done with Mr. Waddles kind of to expand some of his work with the um, project literacy? Yeah, I'll highlight some of the work that happened in the ELA team in particular over the past three years around a full curriculum audit, um, working with uh, Goldie Mohammed around really analyzing the cultural relevance of our text and really making some significant changes to the curriculum and what our students read in the classroom, leveraging our teachers like Mr. Waddles to really guide us in that in those decisions. Um, Mr. Waddles has been humble and not uh, elevating the expansion of his project lit work that we're looking to uh, expand to other middle schools as well. And what I would say, um, having worked with Stanford for for the past four years, was really a notable shift in the culture of the school in tandem with the um, academic excellence at the school. So those two things work hand in hand together. There was a notable shift with the restorative work that they had done over the past four years that the school felt different. You could feel it stepping out of the campus, the connections between students and teachers, the relationship between students and students and how they interacted. Um, culture is one of those things that's often hard to pinpoint. Um, and it really is a, a collaborative effort across the entire school through their clubs, but through their also the, the daily connections and interactions between teachers and students on a regular basis and how they addressed um, students and the conflicts that they had and how they worked through those. And that's reflected in their suspension data, a significant drop in suspensions at the school, as well as just in the relationships and how students um, work together. And I would say on the academic side, Dow referenced just briefly the engagement practices that they'd focused on this past year 
and the engagement, uh, what I would say engagement for engagement's sake versus engagement to support learning. And in our most recent CIV in the spring, we noticed some real positive practices around engagement to support learning and to deepen learning. Um, so that's really a credit to the entire staff. Their math team also really embraced uh, our building thinking classrooms work and have really shifted some of their practices as well, which is not the focus of today, but really is a testament to um, the commitment on behalf of the staff as a whole um, to really support student learning and to support a shift in the culture. Sorry, I know we're low on time, but I just wanted to say to your, uh, Dr. Benitez, to your point about um, scale and, and what we're doing, I think it's really already begun. There's that old saying, it's, it's in the water. Uh, we're trying to get it in the water. And uh, in particular, I think uh, under uh, Dr. Ahn's uh, guidance, uh, I think that um, our aspiring program for leadership, uh, I, th I believe that uh, most of those that go through that are being trained in restorative uh, practices. And I think it's become uh, the norm at many of our middle schools. So we're seeing it happen more and more and certainly at high schools. So you're seeing the expansion happen. Uh, the money has been put behind it. Um, uh, Amy Love, who is uh, kind of the, 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 the force behind that, um, has done a great job. So I just wanted to, to, to circle back around to you on that, that I believe it is expanding. And, and again, Project Lit is, is uh, going to expand as well from what I'm to understand. And so I couldn't be more proud of that. My son also had Mr. Waddles and it shows in his writing. My wife and I are constantly floored by what he produces as, in his senior year at Milligan. So the proof's in the pudding. And I know a lot of other people are shaking their heads as well. He is a difference maker and I'm proud to uh, call him a friend, but proud to call him up here. So. I just like to um, commend you for the work that you're doing with students. The fact that students are staying after school to come to your club speaks volumes of your work. So thank you for the work that you're doing. So we continue on with our elementary uh, team and so we're going to take a little look at our foundational reading skills SBAG so we'd like to start out with looking at our SBAC data um, there was a little changeover all in SBAC percent of students who met and exceeded standards in reading and math for each grade um, we are seeing that the greatest gains were made in third grade so I want to reference again our group of third graders, our group of third graders are our group that when the pandemic started, they were in kindergarten. And so when we closed our schools, our kindergartners were sent home and the following year is the year that they were online in first grade. And in elementary, K and one and two are those critical years where our students who come in with diverse needs, learning abilities, are really getting that foundation to be able to learn how to read, engage in discourse. And so we wanted to highlight third grade specifically because our overall across our district, third grade made some, some gains in both um, reading and you know we saw some gains in math, but very proud of our third graders who are now fourth graders. Our foundational reading data is, it, it trended in a way that showed a lot of growth, positive, positive growth, and I wanna highlight the fact that we changed some of our practices in terms of assessing our students. In the past, we would assess our students and it was more to gather baseline data. Sometimes students, um, when we think about our diverse students, students came in in kinder, perhaps not speaking English as our first language, and they're asked to be given this, they're given this assessment that's looking at um, phonemic awareness. And so our shift in our way of giving assessments changed to actually assess skills that were taught. And the data speaks to why that was an important shift because we saw gains specifically when you look at our English learners. Our English learners across kinder, first and second grade, we saw this continued um, growth and it's, it's important to highlight that because when we talk about our English language learners, we're, we're thinking about them to ensure that they don't become long-term English learners. So 
we have today a school that made some gains and we want to share that they had some positive outliers in terms of their data, both in SBAC as well as foundational reading skills. Yeah. And if I could just add in, and I think it's, it's really important to, to point this out. So if you can go back to the slide with third grade, um, you may know that we are, we are able, through our, core, our work with core districts, we're able to look at um, results across all of the largest school districts in the state of California. Um, the information isn't published, so we can't share the, the information publicly, but we're able to see how we compared to some of those larger districts. In particular, the third grade results in Long Beach Unified are far and above what we're seeing across some of the largest districts. Overall, we're actually doing pretty well compared to other um, large districts, in, in, in many cases exceeding their growth. But in particular, third grade, these are students who were heavily impacted kindergarten and first grade. Um, across the country, we're seeing major impacts, long, long lasting impacts that you know we see in our fourth fifth sixth seventh and eighth grade but the fact that our third grade students get made five points of gain and then to the next slide the fact that our k2 students are making these accelerated gains in the foundational skills really sets us up for long-term um, recovery long-term not gap closure but not having gaps to begin with um, and that's really some of our goals you can see the kindergarten data there with um, great acceleration and you think about last year being the first year of full day kindergarten in Long Beach Unified and the potential impacts of having our kindergarten students with us for the, that extended time and what that might do to the accelerated data you see there. So um, really set just when we think about comparing to other districts and think about um, setting ourselves up for the future, um, some really nice foundational results in our foundational skills. All right, thank you. So I want to add to that, that also as a former site leader, something that was very impactful at the site level was the ability to be able to look at these assessments and make some instructional moves and be able to look at the data with your teams and be able to differentiate the instruction in the moment to look at which of our students or subgroups were on track and who was not. And what could we change, not only in the classroom, but as a site leader, think about our professional development, like our PD plan. What did we need to change? And so this, I would say that amongst our colleagues that are doing that work at the site level was a game changer for our students as well as our schools. So I actually have the pleasure of introducing um, a colleague uh, Principal Carrie Nemig, and she is going to speak about the data and share her story, um, the story that Lincoln Elementary embarked on. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? It's so nice to be here with all of you again. This is my fourth time presenting to you in eight years. Um, the last time I presented to you was March of 2020. And every time I've come, it's been an honor to be here to represent my Lincoln community. And it's so nice to be on the other side of 2020. And I have some really nice celebrations to share. So my story at Lincoln started in August of 2015. And I went to Lincoln and I noticed the parking lot was full. I'm like, what is going on? It's summer break, but the parking lot was full. So to me, as a new principal at that school, it was my second school, that was a really good sign because people were busy working. And when I started looking at the data, I have a couple data points I want to share with you that are, you don't need paper or anything. It's just very easy to remember. Um, math scores on SBAC were 17%. At Lincoln, all students, 17% math. My special education scores were 3%, and my African American student scores were 2.9%. The students who are English language learners in 2015 were 10% higher than students that spoke English. By 2019, just four years later, with incremental growth each year, our math scores went from 17% to 57%. My students who are African American, their scores went from 2.9 to 50%. In 2015, I also want to share the reading scores. 23% of my, of my students in 2015 met on the SBAC, just 23%. And all, that's not very much, right? 
And then African American students was 14%, just 14% of my students were meeting. But by 2019, all students were reading at 51%, and my African American students were reading at 46%. The reason this is significant right now is not only because our scores go up every single year, given the pandemic as well, right? But that they're still going up. And so for the first time, my students who are African American, their scores are higher in the category of all than everyone. So my African American student scores in ELA and math are higher than the category of all. Um, with a 10% jump last year in reading. So, so that's, that's really great. Um, and a point outside of this discussion that I think is really important, number one is that's not enough. We still have work to do. But number two, in 2019, Lincoln was given an award by Innovate for the Los Angeles County Low Income African American Students in Math. And then in 2020, my students who are Latino were given the, the same award in both math and ELA. So that was very encouraging for my staff. You can imagine being the lowest school in the district in terms of SBAC scores to, to receiving awards. So how are we doing this? That's the question. I'm so honored to be here today to share that story. There are many, many intentional systems that we've put in place over the years. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to explain them all to you. But if any of what I'm saying is sparking joy, you are more than welcome to come and visit us. We would love to have you. That's from my teachers. OK, so. Um, some of our systems are social emotional learning and our use of making the equity policy a living document going hand in hand just like dr lynn said with ex ed educational with excellence okay so the document for equity is married to the six understandings and expectations that the curriculum office has given us to look at um, we have a professional development cycle and within that cycle my administration and I, my assistant principal and I, we leave teacher feedback, but with, with the feedback is teacher support. And just as Ms. Madrigal said, the support is differentiated for each teacher um, because you can't expect change if you're not going to provide support. It's nice to give my opinion about something, but I really need to be in the game and, and teaching teachers of what I know and working in partnership with them. We also have been working on connections and partnerships with communities. AOC7 has been outstanding. Anything I need, they're there for me and my school. But we have other partnerships, too. People bring food to Lincoln twice a month. We have lines around the corner. Um, we have people coming to give glasses. We have dentists coming. We have um, health clinics. We have so much going on in terms of community support. All of that is part of this process of improvement. Um, we also have been talking and knowing the difference between parent involvement and parent engagement. Those are very different things. And Ms. Hernandez is going to talk more about that in just a few minutes. And what I've been doing as much as I can, which is a lot, right, as the principal, I own that, is empowering teacher voice and empowering student voice and empowering my teachers to listen to students. Um, but also paying attention to who is not saying anything. Who are the quiet people? And what are they thinking? And why are they quiet? Okay. So all of those systems are part of the change that has happened. But in our time together, because it's so short, I just want to highlight two. Our interventions and our professional development and the idea of rigor. Because when we brought in rigor, it changed everything. So when I was talking about this 2.9% for math and the 17% for math and then the 23% right for for reading I was really confounded because people were working like I said the parking lot was full and people were there late and early and teachers were teaching they all had a plan there's not a single lazy teacher at Lincoln they're all hard-working people so when I was going in to leave feedback I really it took me a few I would say it took me about eight weeks to figure out what is going on and what I noticed in my feedback was a pattern that in both math and ELA, we were not asking higher level questions. So we had this really good plan, but we were asking right there questions in both subjects. So right there questions are questions you can find in the book. What is the title of the story? What is the setting of the story? Who, what, where, when, how? 
Okay, so when I noticed that, I thought we need to really get involved in higher level thinking. So what is that? Without launching into a big explanation, let's just say let's let's talk about theme, author's purpose, right? Things that are not attached to a story, but you can think about it using text evidence, right? Some people call that the DOK, depth of complexity, okay? Um, and we married that, for those of you who know, with Bloom's taxonomy. So for example, on Monday, maybe we do the right there questions. We define, we say what, where does the story take place? Who are the main characters? But by Friday, let's hope we're talking about higher level questions. So I'm just gonna give you a quick example so you know what I'm, I'm talking about. As any good principal will do, if you're giving a professional development to teachers, you want it to be engaging and you need to have a plant or two in the audience, okay? You need to have a couple people who know what you're about to do. So I set out to introduce this idea of higher level questioning to my staff in, in 2015. And I said to them, you all know the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. Yes, and you all know the story, right? It's a story our grandparents knew, our great grandparents knew. And I said, um, you know, the story where things are sometimes too much or too little or just right. And we went over the right there questions. So I took my staff through this as if they were students, but respecting them as adults. And so we talked about the right there questions, who, what, where, when, right? Um, the setting was the forest, the house, the main characters were the bear, Goldilocks. And then I said to my staff, I have a question for you, and I want you to talk at your tables about this, and then we'll talk whole group. So at that moment, I'm modeling again what they can do in their class, right, for collaborative conversations. So I said to them, don't you think Goldilocks should go to jail? And I skewed it that way, like, don't you think, like, you agree with me, right? Because that is not anything ever anyone ever thought about with Goldilocks. Right now, you're probably like, what? The reason I said that is because Goldilocks broke into somebody's house, she damaged their furniture, she ate their food, she vandalized and basically was a squatter, okay? So you're chuckling a little bit, you have a smile, but you're engaged. My staff was the same way. This is how one question can change the entire trajectory of a student's thinking. My staff then thought about it, they debated it, they had fun with it, it was a fun staff meeting. And then we talked about a whole group and there was a big debate and someone actually said, where are her parents? Somebody should call DCFS on them. So, <laughs> so it was like a whole very engaging um, activity. But at the end, what I want students to do and that I shared with them was I want them to take what they learned in writing, using the text evidence that they have, evaluate the story and answer that question. And then I said, but you are adults, so what I want you to do is write about how you can incorporate this tomorrow because the best professional developments happen like that where you spark ideas with each other and my staff collectively you know they're they're way smarter than we are right all of those heads together working together and so that's what happened that is part of the difference that happened at Lincoln the change of higher level thinking where we're not just stuck answering low level questions the other piece is how would you do that in math so super easy in math we had another professional development and I said the answer is four so if the answer is four then what is the mathematical question and here is where we can give voice to kids because if the answer is four there are many entry points to that so if I'm a special education student maybe I'm drawing four circles doesn't matter what grade I'm in, but I know what four is. If I am a fifth grade gate student, maybe I say the square root of 16. But if you think about it, if you have four kids at a table or six kids at a table, and everyone has a different entry point into that mathematical problem, then you have four kids or six kids talking and learning about different ways to solve a problem or to create something, which is what they're doing. And then the teacher just says, prove it, okay? And so then we have kids talking about math in a very different way. They're not going down and answering questions, they're creating math, they're talking about math, they're writing about math. And so it becomes much more engaging. And so having various, a variety of entry points is also a way to promote equity through academics. And so, so that is 
just a little snapshot of the work that, that we've been doing. And I just wanna say that last year, out of 150 second graders, 70 kids were at kinder level because we have the iReady data. And so my second grade teachers, and obviously third grade, we had some similar results, but my to point of just a picture for you, my second grade teachers were teaching kindergarten, first grade, and second grade in one year, right? And so this year, just 5% of our second graders are working at kinder level. You know how many kids that is? Eight. So representing this work of Lincoln teachers and the dedication for Lincoln teachers, because we talked about like how do we push kids, right? How do we raise them up and accelerate them? We also have to continue to help the kids who maybe have some learning gaps due to the pandemic. And so uh, Ms. Maria Martin, Ms. Maria Hernandez is here and she's going to share with us with passion and authenticity. Good morning. Uh, my name is Maria J. Hernandez and I'm a proud product of Long Beach Unified School District. I graduated from Long Beach Poly in 2008 for CIC and these last two years I've had the privilege of being the Instruction and Interventions Coordinator at Lincoln Elementary. As Ms. Nemec mentioned, we have a lot of systems in place to support our students, but how are we supporting our African American students, our black students? It all starts with Students don't care what we know until they know that you care. So when I first came to Lincoln, and it was uh, three years ago, August 2021, our very first faculty meeting, we went back and looked at our equity training that summer. We pulled out our community cultural wealth to support learning. We discussed how can we support our students as grade levels as a school to find out what are their assets that they can bring? What type of surveys can we give our students? How can we build those relationships? Because it doesn't, we can't go to instruction, we can't go to PD, we can't do interventions until we build those relationships with our families and our students. So that's exactly where we started. Then as a school, we asked ourselves, okay, so how will students and families know that we truly care about them? We also implemented the two by 10 method that we also learned through the equity training that summer. We made personal phone calls to our families that year, welcoming them back to school, introducing them to the teachers and started building that connection right away. Um, one thing that I'm very proud of is you would never hear a teacher say, that's not my student or that's not my concern. No, there's a high collective efficacy at Lincoln. There's first graders, second graders that fifth grade teachers know. There's a relationships. All of our teachers, staff members, certificate, classified, doesn't matter. We're all on that same page that we are putting our students first. And we get to know their names, their stories. A few things that has been working for us is, for example, we have reading buddies. So our fifth grade teachers team up with our second grade teachers. And our fifth graders are reading with our second graders. So we're building relationships right there. We have student aides, fourth and fifth grade scholars that instead of going to recess, they will prefer to help out in a kindergarten classroom or a first grade classroom to help out with their foundational reading skills. Our morning supervision, we have teachers supervising different areas that is not their grade level to meet and greet other students and get to know who they are, their names, their story, who's their teacher, and just have fun with the kids out there. Another thing that's helping us too is all of our teachers are dismissing the students in front of the school. So there's constantly that community connection with our parents, right? Parents are not scared to come up to the office or come and talk to the teacher because they're constantly seeing us. There's a high visibility of rec aides, admin team, teachers constantly on our campus that parents feel comfortable coming and asking for support. By having these relationships and collaborations, we're all supporting our students. Then the part, the instruction, the interventions part, uh, we look at our interventions with intention. So for example, we constantly are looking at data and we look at what do our students need. Uh, Ms. Madrigal mentioned earlier that we're constantly looking at data and we're making shifts as, as a school site. I remember our very first year, that first semester, we were working on LLI, right? We looked at our data, we looked in January and we're like, 
No, we, our kids need foundational reading skills. We have a lot of students that are in pre-K, kindergarten le level, that didn't know their letters or their sounds. So we just shift our whole literacy team intervention from LLI to just focusing on foundational reading skills. Then the next year, the district's like, yeah, you guys, we're seeing the gains. We're going to make that as a system, offer that for other elementary schools that if, you, if your kids are not ready for LLI, you can do foundational reading and support your students. Um, one thing that I really, really love about our system is our SST process. So many schools have an SST process that they just focus on a few students, right? They talk about the few students, the ones that they need some type of support. At Lincoln, we focus on all of our students. So as an admin team, specialist team, instruction team, we sit down with all of our teachers and talk about roughly 900 students. Not once, but three times a school year. And we talk about every single student at our school about their successes, what's their story, because our goal is finding out who our students are, not just their names, but their stories. And then saying like, hey, what services do they need from us? Do they need the nurse? Do they need the FRC? Do they need glasses? What do we need to support them? And if an African-American student is not on grade level or above, they're in an intervention. We put them in every single intervention. So our interventions ranges from everything from our outside tutoring, tutoring agency, small groups, after school tutoring, Saturday school. And sometimes it's just talking to us and setting those small goals, long-term goals, and making sure like someone is on, on accountable, keeping them accountable, kind of like what our high school students said. You know, they have someone there kind of guiding them. And we revisit our pulse survey. We identify who are our students that don't feel like they belong or the self-identity. And we talk to them. We have someone on our admin team reach out and talk to our students, find out their why, what's going on. And then we amplify their voice. So moving forward, we're going to continue doing what we're doing. And this year, I'm the SEL facilitator and math lead. So I'll be continuing working with our community outreach. AOC 7, we have a retreatish event October 7th. So if you guys are free on Saturday, feel free to stop by. And then as the math lead, I'll be supporting third, fourth, and fifth grade with a tier one and tier two instruction. What's that? Can you imagine you're a fifth grade parent and you can talk to that teacher every day? That doesn't happen in other places. And this came from my teachers. So when we used to have dismissal and it was crazy, um, you know, we just let the kids out and then it was madness, right? So now all of my teachers just take all of the kids out to the front of the school and every parent who has time to pick up their kid, right? That day, they can talk to the teachers every day. And what that has done collectively is really improve the relationships with parents and teachers and admin because we're accessible. There's no mystery there. We're, we're right there. And so parents can send, you know, an older son or older daughter to come and talk to us too, whatever, whatever they need. But I, I, that has really impacted the relationships and increased the trust at Lincoln. And so what, what I would just say is we still have a lot of work to do. 50% is not enough. And we know that. Um, we're committed to this excellence and equity. It has to go together because our goal is to have our children reading and doing math just as well as any other school in any other state across our country. So just like Goldilocks, there may have been times when we have done too much in one way, right? Or maybe we didn't do enough too little in one way, and we're working on getting things just right. Uh, Dr. Benitez. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hernandez, Ms. Nemec. Um, so uh, uh, an ask of, of, uh, of uh, Brian and, and, the, and the team. So we heard some really good data that you shared with us, Ms. Nemec, and I really love that you broke it down. You gave us a 215, 
and then the gain and, and or the growth. But, but I really love getting a sense of how our black students are doing, how our special education students are doing, how our English learners are doing. So if, if, if we get a chance, Ms. Madrigal, uh, uh, Mr. Moskowitz, for the schools that we heard today, I was trying to write down stuff as Dow was saying it, whatever, L would love to get uh, you know, a better sense of, of some of the data. So thank you for sharing that, that data, Ms. Nemec. Um, I also appreciate the, that although you, you frame it around gains, that you're consistently saying and thinking it's not enough, right? It's not enough. Uh, so we can talk about gains all day, but starting so low, right, with 2.9%, that's tremendous growth, tremendous gain, but 50%. Uh, right, we still had a lot of work uh, to do, so, so I want to I go on that anchor. Uh, and acknowledging the partnership piece uh, here with not just AOC7, but all the other community organizations. So Dr. Baker and I got a chance a couple weeks ago to go out to, uh, to Lincoln, and, and we run into each other at a bunch of other Lincoln events. Um, so at the end of the day for me, the, the beauty in the site visit and then hearing this presentation and then with all our data presentations, uh, is getting a really intimate sense of change happens in the classroom, right? End of the day, we can talk about 65,000 students, 85 schools, whatever, but we're really talking about the, the biggest impact, and we talk about it, uh, but seeing it, I think, is important that the change is happening in the classroom. Everyday teachers, like you said, are working hard uh, right, but, but are we maximizing on the opportunity to accelerate growth, uh, right, with particularly our highest needs uh, students? Um, and, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to caveat it because then I'm going to have teachers, Mr. Calabi, come back and say, oh, Juan talks about data. And, uh, I'm acknowledging the biggest impact here is from teachers, right, in the classroom. But it was very curious, Ms. Nemec, when we talk about impact, uh, there has to be accountability. Uh, built into that and um, and I asked you a, a couple of times and you shared with us here um, it's imp impact requires support and in order to know what teachers need and and, and how they feel uh, with with regards to support you need to have intimate interaction with them in the classroom so every classroom that we hit up or was it maybe 10 classrooms that day I think we visited close to 10 maybe it was seven or eight um, there were very specific things that you were looking for, Ms. Nemec. Not like I'm out to get this teacher, but reinforcing things that you covered in your professional development, right? In your meetings, you just talked about the, you know, the examples that you gave in your meeting. Can you talk a little bit more? Because, in, and here I'm talking more for our parents uh, watching, like what are we looking for in the classroom to happen? And how do we set that high, that high level question, those high level expectations? If that's what we're attributing a lot of this growth around, right? Setting high expectations, having accountability systems in place with the right supports, right? With, with the supports that teachers are the ones that determine what do I need, right? But what are we looking for at the end of the day? Because you, you pointed it out to, you know, Dr. Baker obviously knew what we're looking for, but you were pointing it out to me. You were looking for specific things. You were, you, you were, you, were, uh, you know, saying, hip, do more of that, but you were also saying in, 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 a, in a very tactful and strategic way, hey, you know, what, what about this, right? I remember specifically uh, one of the classrooms that we entered, uh, there was a question around 9-11, because I think, I believe we visited right around and or on 9-11, and the vast majority of the students had no idea what 9-11 was. So at some breakout uh, groups, um, there was a question, right? What do you know about 9-11? What, what happened on 9-11? Most, if not all, the students in the breakout rooms had a question mark. Like, I don't know what that is. Uh, but then there were strategies, right? For, so students would feel engaged that even if they didn't know what 9-11 was. So I'm, I'm speaking for you here, Ms. Nevick, but I, but I really want to, to harp on that point. Like, we're talking about things in the classroom, even though we're taking this wide, big picture perspective. Can you speak to that? Dr. Benitez, could you please repeat that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I will take another I'm seven kidding. minutes right now to ask the question, Ms. Nemec. I'm good. I'm sorry. You know how much I, I just love to tease Dr. Benitez. He's been a huge, huge support of, of Lincoln. Um, 
and I do appreciate that. Uh, that's a great question. So two things. The first thing is, um, in terms of our African American students and all of our students, what we're really looking for is growth, right? So I shared about how our African American students are now higher than all, but we actually had that conversation like, what about the other 50%? What's going on? And so we looked them up and everyone grew a year except for two. And the two were new. And so we have our eye on, the, on those kids. So I just wanted to reassure you that we're actually looking deeper than just like who's meeting. It's, it's also like, where are we growing, right? That's what our goal is for our kids. We just want growth. And that's what I tell my teachers and they agree too. And the reason that I tell my teachers that to your question is they're part of the conversation. So when you are looking to accelerate learning or you're looking to think about higher level thinking, some of the support that I give is really sometimes it's just the language to use. So for example, in that class that you saw that was a newer teacher, He's a great teacher. He has so much uh, potential and he's learning. And so there, there were about, I think it was like eight groups, maybe table groups. And there, at, at almost all the groups, one person knew what it was, but at like three groups, they were just sitting there like, I, I don't know. And then he said, you have about, what did he say? Like five or 10 minutes to think about it. So um, that's a long time if no one knows. So we just went around and I, I said, hey, how about if like there's two people at this table who know what it is, move them over there. And then they could teach each other. And so then that's what happened in that in that class. Um, and so, you know, what could have been potentially uh, an issue turned out to be really successful because he was able to monitor and adjust his own instruction right away. But when I go into a classroom and it has shifted now. I do look for, for things in the classroom, but I don't wanna make this about me. This should be about my teachers and what they want for their kids. And so together we l are looking for the same thing. So if you ever come to visit, you would see in a classroom a learning target that's clear. So, so sometimes um, if people are not planned, you might hear, today we're gonna do math. So the word do is nebulous. What does that actually mean? Are we going to add? Are we going to multiply? Are we going to subtract? Are we going? Are we going to do a number talk? Like, let's be. Let's have clarity in our learning target. And then for the students, so that they know how, that they've been successful, we have success criteria for every lesson. So success criteria is basically just. It's almost like a checklist. Like what. Can, what does my paper look like and what are the expectations or the criteria that my teacher has set for me? And then in some classrooms, what happens is the kids create their own learning target. The teacher might do an inquiry lesson, like if the answer is four, what is the mathematical problem that you're, what is the mathematical question? So at the end of that lesson, a teacher might actually say to their class, what do you think you learned today? And they might create the learning target at the end of the lesson. Um, so when I go into a classroom, I'm looking for clarity. That's the number one answer because the more clear we are with ourselves when we're planning, then the more clear we can be with our students. If I could just build on that and I appreciate that, um, Carrie. I think Carrie is, is a very highly effective principal. She's been at Lincoln for a number of years. The teachers at Lincoln are amazing people. So there, you know, you ask what's the secret sauce. Part of it is just a really high functioning school working together. But you also asked about this idea of how do we scale this up? And I think one of the advantages of a concept of a chief academic office, for example, we have the opportunity and you heard Dr. Baker mention this. What do we want for students in every classroom across our district? If we're gonna achieve that, what do all of our teachers need to know and be able to do in the classroom? And this year we have a great opportunity through support from Dr. Lund's team to provide face-to-face -face training to every single teacher in the district around a framework for instruction that is tailored to their specific content. And that's, a un that's unique for what, from what we've done recently. We may have provided broad pedagogical um, support, but this is actually tailored to a biology teacher's classroom at high school, a third grade math teacher's classroom, or whatever it may be, so that's important. Then we have to ask ourselves, well, how are we gonna measure that? How will we actually measure and see, are we making the progress based on that professional development? And so we, we have a research and school improvement office that can help us figure out how do we measure that? And in fact, both Friday and yesterday, a team of uh, district leaders and teachers, we were together talking about if we provided this high quality professional development to every teacher this year, 
what might we look for in every classroom to understand if that's actually occurring? So we're right now in the development of what would be those look fors based on the training that we can provide then. The, third, the, the last other part would be then how do we support and hold accountable our principals to see that instructional vision through to improvement in the classroom? So from expectations for teachers and principals, how are we going to measure that? What supports do they need? Um, and really bringing curriculum, school support services, research, level offices together in that conversation. But we have to be clear on what we expect to see in the classroom. We have to support teachers and staff to bring that to fruition. We have to monitor it in a really intentional way with clear expectations and support. And then um, again, using our principles as that key lever to make that happen. So that, that's kind of on the broader scale, some things that are going on behind the scenes right now. Thanks. I'd have to say, in addition to um, the uh, direct instruction teachers in the classroom, I also heard that um, it takes a village, that you have wraparound services, you have uh, community partners that come in and provide a lot of services. And that, I think, in addition to having teachers and staff accessible to the parents and families, is very helpful. And I believe, and it sounds like that takes away a lot of the um, outside pressures. They have support with, um, with food, with uh, dental care, I think you mentioned, and, and those types of things so that the kids can come to school ready to learn and be receptive to those classroom improvements. Um, <clears throat> so that sounds very beneficial. It sounds like you've taken a... a a total approach to the whole child, um, which I'm sure has helped. And I also appreciate that attitude of, you know, <coughs> yes, we've made these incredible gains, but that's not good enough. And I think that's the attitude that we take as a district is, you know, sure, our numbers may be, you know, uh, showing that we're outperforming maybe different districts in the state or whatever, but I think we need to be focused on what our kids are doing and really work on improving that because really, truly, that's what matters. And if you're a parent in this district, that's what you want to see. You kind of aren't concerned about kids in other districts, but what's my kid doing? What do, what's the district doing for my kid? It sounds like you're doing an a, incredible amount for these students. And again, inspirational. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing uh, you know, what's happening at Lincoln. And I love that um, if this sparks joy, then you know, come for a visit. Um, I know it was sparking joy with me, so I would like to come for a visit. Uh, do we have anything else, colleagues? Sounds or like a community schools approach, Madam Chair. Wink, wink. <laughs> What's going on at Lincoln? And they're doing it very nicely, yes. Um, Ms. Madrigal. Well, thank you for the opportunity today to showcase our schools and having them really tell their story. And I want to thank Lakewood, Stanford, and Lincoln for the opportunity to share that with the broader community. Our goal this year is to give voice to the data and really to think about data in terms of humanizing it and continuing this dialogue around data. And Dr. Benitez, at an, up, at a, at an upcoming board update, Dr. Baker will definitely have those data points so that it can support the stories. Um, so we look forward to sharing that with Dr. Baker. And we're going to open it up for questions, and thank you so much. Mr. Miller. Yeah, well, first off, uh, I know that uh, all the presenters have pretty much left, except for our folks at Lincoln, so I wanted to thank you guys for being here. But all, just all of the uh, folks who came out today to support um, what we know are some of the outliers happening at some of our campuses. Uh, I think that it is important to hear these anecdotal components and using some of these positive stories as tools to build upon so we can see what success looks like. I, I'm a firm believer in obviously recognizing our faults, but using success as a model to uh, emulate and grow. And so uh, having these outliers today, I think, help support some of the efforts that we obviously want to achieve. Uh, the one thing that I think Dr. Benitez has already hit on, and I want to uh, follow up on is that when we're talking about 
uh, some of the components of our outliers, right? Uh, we're talking about uh, from the high school level, there were hyper-engaged staff members uh, and those that have a uh, cultural understanding and undertone supporting one of our at-risk demographics and our black students. Uh, then you take a look at our elementary level, where once again we're talking about another outlier, and they're talking about how they're working with local community groups and having this, uh, once again, hyper-engaged relationship with folks providing resources, along with using the data to support uh, patient, I mean patient, woof, student improvement, right? <laughs> uh, and then, thirdly, we look at our middle school level, right? Uh, where we're talking about uh, the use of additional programs and after-school programming, once again, as a tool to improve student outcomes. And all of these are undertones of the goals of community schools and the opportunities that, that could be created with the use of a community school model with the additional resources. And so uh, as I hear these outliers, which is great to see that our district is already doing some of the let's call it, yes, tenements or principles of a uh, community school, I can't help but see the great potential in having a firmly solidified uh, model within our district to support these efforts uh, from both uh, administrative con um, infrastructural piece, but then also uh, obviously trickling all the way down to supporting our families and our students. And so uh, uh, as I see all of our presenters today, I couldn't help but hear those things in the back of my mind. And so I was very, very pleased to see them, but I, I can still see even more potential. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Otto. Yeah, I, I just missed the community school connection. What, what's, what's going on specifically there? No, I wasn't saying that there was uh, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, this wasn't a community you. schools yeah. conversation. I was just talking about the principles that we've seen in all three presentations have undertones that are also linked to the community schools. So, so we're not, there's nothing specific that's going on at Lincoln. Uh, well, I think. I, I got it more from Juan than I did from you. Yeah. Well, I think the um, connection may have been that the community is working with Lincoln that we have community partners at Lincoln that provide different services, mm -hmm. um, as with, you know, dental. Sure. Um, no, and I, I heard that. I just thought yeah. I heard those. Uh, I think that's what we're, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think that's what we're talking about, is how the community and Lincoln are collaborating okay. for the students. Correct. We're talking about from a principal base, not from a practice base. That's, that was my point. And it's a, an organic effort. Okay. Oh, Dr. Benitez. Yeah, so just uh, um, sort of two things that I took away from all the presentations today. Uh, so I guess this is sort of a handoff back to Mr. Moskovitz and Ms. Madrigal and the team. Um, so we heard gains in growth a lot uh, with respect to our outlier uh, presentations. Um, and, and I guess this is a sneak peek uh, to our next conversations. Um, the gains in growth context, context for me uh, is anchored in our in closing gaps, uh, right, for our highest need students. So I just want to make sure that, that, that I'm taking away um, sort of the second uh, thing here with gains in growth, that um, we are experiencing um, gains in growth for all students, but in particular that we want to draw down that we are not significantly experiencing gains in growth for our highest need students to the extent where we're um, closing gaps, uh, right, at the both uh, levels that we want to, uh, but with the certainty that this is the path that we're gonna follow, right? And that's why I think these outlier conversations are so important. So I don't, I, I, I don't want to uh, lose um, the point here that for post-secondary indicators, um, we did experience uh, some gains in growth for um, our science all uh, with respect to black students, for our math all with respect to uh, black students, and with our English all with respect to. So we made slight gains, 2%, 2%, uh, 3%. Uh, 
Um, but again, what we're looking for, if I'm understanding correct, correctly, is significant gains so that we can close these gaps. For Dr. our middle Brandes, school. Before, Dr. Brandes, yes. before you go on to middle school, yeah. I'll just refer you back to page five for an example of accelerated growth. So when you see ninth grade on track for A through G, you see a 4% increase for all students. Can you tell me what page again? Page oh. five. Yeah, page five and an 8% growth yes. for black students. Yes. So just to give one glimpse at what accelerated growth yeah. or moving towards gap yes. closure can look like that's a good representation in yeah. one area of our work. You, you preempted me, that. Dr. Yeah. Baker. I was, I was just about to okay. highlight, for example, that's one area where we have significant growth, both for all, but particularly for our students where we wanna close gaps. So I was gonna do the same thing for middle school. So for middle school, same thing, um, right? We have examples where um, in some cases we didn't experience uh, growth in reading or math, but then we do have an example in seventh grade where we have a two percent, uh, a, two, a plus two uh, increase. Uh, and then for elementary schools, uh, not we're seeing an overall growth, FRSA proficiency in kindergarten, 11, black is 11, but really in the second grade is where we're seeing the growth for black students is nine, Overall growth is five, so again, we're diminishing the gap there. So you, you took me right down the path, Dr. Baker. So I just wanted to key in on, we do have examples of significant growth, uh, right, to build on, and I'm glad to hear from Dr. Lon and for you, Mr. Moskovitz, that we're also thinking about how do we leverage uh, these examples so that we see that kind of growth and gain with our other students. So thank you for that, Dr. Baker. Okay, so, oh. Uh, Ms. Just, Lopez. Yeah, just one thing is we are seeing growth where um, schools are centering their work on students, and it's great. Um, there's still some room for improvement, and uh, I just want us to keep in mind that the schools that presented today really looked at their school community and focused their work on students and the needs of their the community that they're working with at their school. So it's not a one-size-fit-all. So what we do in one school does not necessarily I will not necessarily work at another school so like what's happening at Lincoln what they're doing will not necessarily work at a school like Newcomb right because the populations are different but uh, just wanted to point out that I think a lot of the growth has to do with um, the work that is centered on students thank you okay so if there are no further uh, questions or <clears throat> or discussion I want to thank everybody for the presentations thank you for being with us um, I also want to acknowledge our uh, um, representatives from the research staff. Um, you are allowing us to see that there's so much work behind the scenes. We usually hear from one senior staff member about research, and I know for myself, I forget that there's a whole staff that works full-time overtime on providing us with these numbers and we are always asking for more numbers more data and i love that you frame it in the context of how these numbers tell a story that they're just not isolated numbers somewhere but how it relates to our greatest resource which is the you know our, our people and our students so we will take a break um, we will take a 10 minute break and reconvene and, and, um, and get to work on the next part of our workshop. Thank you, everyone.
AJ. When we Welcome back, everybody. Um, we will get started with our goals and governance conversation. And um, Dr. Baker, I think you have an introduction to make. Great, thank you. So what a great start to the morning to hear about system-wide data and some positive outliers from schools. And as Ms. Madrigal said, to hear the stories behind the data that you all have been looking at. So this um, is a great opportunity just to continue that conversation based on our student outcomes from last year, um, and to head into the last element of the transition to student outcome focused governance. So we've been up to this for three years and we're nearing the last aspect of transition for our district. In our last meeting on September 6, in the work working session, you all uh, presented goals that you had thought about from student outcomes, you talked in pairs and interacted with AJ Grabbell on your potential goals and guardrails and, and you did some brainstorming and some leaning into things that you saw for the district. Our homework from AJ was to go back in, which Mr. Moskovitz and I worked together with the research office on this, to go back in and look at the themes across the goals that you represented and then to have some backup data for you to look at as a means of really thinking about which of those goals you would want to select for your, your board goals. So what you um, were presented last week was our homework, and that is six potential goals in the form of recommended Board of Education goals um, and a set of five guardrails that came from the themes that you all talked about in the September 6 session. And so AJ is coming in via Zoom today to facilitate the next step session with you all that gets closer or determines the goals that you will establish. The significance of this moment is that it also will um, allow for interim goals and guardrails to be developed that associate with your goals and a monitoring calendar. So we've heard a lot this morning about accountability and monitoring and the impact of very focused efforts around our black students that took place last year and the outcomes that resulted from that focus. The same will be true for you all when you set your goals and then a monitoring calendar that ensures that board time in the boardroom at board meetings is spent on the outcomes that you are monitoring. And so I'm pleased today to welcome AJ Crabbill in via Zoom to facilitate the next steps in the conversation about goals and guardrails. So Mr. Thanks. Hitson, Thanks. we'll wait for the magic to happen. There, there is. he is. Welcome, AJ. Good to see you. Good day. Good. Thank you for having me again. So it's a joy to be with you all. Yeah. So I want to just briefly make sure we're all on the same page. The board began this process many, many months ago. So this is not a new process. This is not <clears throat> the beginning. You are actually nearing the end of what for you is really slightly more than a year long process. A process that began with doing some intentional listening to the community to try to figure out what is the vision that the community has for what students should know and be able to do, but also to get a sense of what are some of the community's values that have to be honored along the journey to accomplishing that vision. In addition to the board uh, conducting listening, uh, the board is requested of its superintendent some analysis of what are the current areas of high need and high leverage of student performance areas where if the school system is not successful in improving performance, then the students who are impacted by that, <clears throat> this is really their last safety net. Uh, that's what we mean by high need. But by high leverage, we mean areas where if the school system can recalibrate to be highly successful in this area, it's going to have a larger ripple impact on more students uh, throughout the entire school system. And so the administration brought back that information. Grounded in these two data sources, what is the vision and values of the community? And what is the current data about our students? You all began the process uh, at our last session and in the days between then and now 
really trying to brainstorm on what set of goals should we make the focus of the organization for the next five years. Based on that rough draft, uh, that brainstorming exercise, your superintendent uh, has come back with a set of potential goals and potential guardrails for you all to consider. That brings us to our work today. The work today is for the six of you collectively to go through the potential goals that are available, the potential guardrails that are available, and then make some decisions about <clears throat> which, if any of these, make the most sense for your organization for the next five years. Um, and when you adopt your goals and your guardrails, you are saying this is the central focus of our organization. And that's like it's the only thing that's going to happen, but you're saying it's what you as a board are going to uh, pour the vast majority of your time and energy into. And so it's important the decision you make, uh, because I want to ex express before we dive into this, what will you use them for? Once you have goals and guardrails, this will be how you evaluate your superintendent. This will be the set of metrics used to determine um, is she shepherding the district in uh, the appropriate direction? You'll use this to determine whether or not to adopt a budget. As your superintendent brought you a budget, it actually um, honors the community's vision, honors the community's values. Uh, you'll use this uh, when it comes time to considering revisions to your LCAP. Um, does this get us closer to the goals while honoring the guard for us? You'll use this when making decisions about almost any agenda item that the superintendent brings before you. If we adopt this item, is this going to help get us closer to our goals while honoring our guardrails? This becomes the centerpiece of your discernment as a board. And so I, I am not overstating this when I say this is probably one of the most important decisions that you'll make in your time uh, on the board. What is going to be our obsessive focus over the next five years? The one other preamble that I'll offer you is the fewer things that you focus on, the greater the likelihood that you accomplish them. So you can have 20 goals, just don't expect that you'll accomplish any. It'll be for window dressing, it'll help you look good, it's like, yes, we have goals, but it won't actually accrue to the benefit of your students because you will have spread the organization so thin that it's unreasonable to expect real performance. Boards that do this glorify the political needs of students at of adults at the expense of the educational needs of students. And so you will be tempted today to try to be all things to all people. And if you succumb to the temptation, you will be choosing to set your students up for failure in exchange for you feeling better. And the good news is you'll feel better. And the third graders who don't learn how to read during your watch will probably never knock on your door. It'll probably work out well for but it won't work out well for the students you serve. You must resist that temptation. This is a process of our prioritization. By the end of our time together, the idea is that you will have identified preferably no more than one to three goals, one to three guardrails, definitely no more than five of each. Recognizing that more of them means that you should expect less growth for each of them. Fewer of them means that you can expect more growth for each of them. So with that as the preamble, what questions do you have before we dive in? Dr. Benitez. AJ, can you see us when we raise our yes. hands? Okay. Uh, thank you for, for walking us through that, uh, AJ, and for reminding us about the work that we've already uh, accomplished to get us to this point. Um, I have a, a, a process question on sort of what potentially comes next, uh, AJ. My, my understanding, um, uh, and in uh, alignment with your book, so I, I, we did read your book uh, <laughs> as well, AJ. Um, is that if we adopt our goals and guardrails today, that we still need to um, inform our communities uh, that this is what this means, right? And walk them through. This means that this is what we're going to be holding ourselves accountable to. Uh, you know, reminding folks that our budget conversations will be anchored in these goals. Reminding folks about a monitoring calendar, uh, because understandably, folks are going to see a pivot. Uh, in our right. board meetings, or they should see a pivot in our board meetings, and maybe left wondering, when did this take place, or why is this happening, or why is there an emphasis on these three if we if we decide on three uh, things? Yeah. So, am I correct in in assuming that 
there should be some community uh, process if we adopt goals today to inform our community about what's next, what these goals are, what this means in terms of evaluating the superintendent and, and the like? Yeah, so two things. One, just because you've been on this road and you've been consistently communicating about being on this road for the better part of a year, uh, you may be tempted to think that you have successfully communicated enough. That would be foolishness. Uh, you will probably never communicate enough about your priorities. And so when you get to the point where you are completely sick and tired of it, where all six of you have perfectly memorized everything there is to know about all of your goals and all the data associated with them and the strategies, and you have grown completely weary of communicating about them over and over and over to Nazia. In that moment, know that you have probably begun to sufficiently communicate about them. <clears throat> so it is definitely the case that as you go beyond today, it is your obligation. It's not the community's obligation to magically know what your intentions are and how you are taking their feedback and turning it into priorities. It's your obligation to go out and communicate that. Now, the second thing I would uh, add to your comment is I do not expect you all to vote to approve a final set of goals and guardrails today. What I do expect you to do is identify what is almost certainly your final set of goals and guardrails today. And the only reason I offer that caveat, because I think ideally today we get to the point where we are 90% certain what they are. The only reason I don't say 100%, now I wouldn't say do the final, final adoption, uh, maybe do the preliminary adoption, the probationary adoption, is because I wouldn't want you to do the final, final adoption until you have uh, the progress measures uh, in your hands. And so once you have your interim goals and interim guardrails as well, and you're certain, absolutely certain that there is a strong alignment uh, between the board and the superintendent, that's the time when then I would say, okay, now go ahead and put the final, final stamp. So I would hope that you all would move forward as a unit, the five of you, and say, these are uh, what we believe our goals and guardrails would be. But I'd hold off on that final, final determination um, until you've got a chance to see the interim goals and interim guardrails. Uh, that way you just are absolutely certain that you're aligned, uh, that your superintendent is aligned with where you as a board are at. Other, uh, so really appreciate uh, those insights. Other questions before we dive into it? Yes, sir. Yeah, this isn't a question, but more of a statement. And that is that um, I, I absolutely agree with you that um, we've been doing this for a long time. I think that when I first started thinking about this, it was after I first met you on the telephone, which was before I got on the board. Right. And, and, um, uh, and yet, what grew, what, and that, that conversation came out of an experience that I had with this mutual friend, David Osborne, who had come out to Long Beach City College and done a, a retreat and uh, we had lots and lots of goals and uh, we asked him what he thought and he said three no more than three <laughs> uh, yeah. because you'll you get back bogged down so i so i second that but the and the second thing i would and only other thing i want to say at this point is i think it's really important that today we make the progress of winding this down so that we're now moving forward because we can't move forward until we do. I'm not saying take a final vote, but, but um, and by the way, it may give us an opportunity to reach out to the community and say, this is what we're thinking. Uh, we're real close. Um, if you got any feedback, let us know. Uh, but yeah, goals and guardrails, I think it's very important that we all are on the, on, on, which word I'm looking for, that, 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 that we make progress now about this because um, we can't do the other things that we're going to be doing without it. So yeah. that's it. And I completely agree. I think you all need to walk out of here today with almost rock solid certainty about exactly what your goals and partners are going to be. Right. Uh, AJ, I don't know. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'm going to ask AJ a question. Can you comment on the um, where an assessment of the board using the tool from your guidance, um, the self-assessment fits into this period of time? And I'll just say, yes. just to bring in the past, 
in October of 2020, you, one of the ways that you started our board in this transition was to ask them about goals at the time and then to talk about the assessment tool that is part of the Student Outcome Focused Governance Manual. So building yeah. on Dr. Benitez's question about next steps, can you just share briefly about when you see the board then doing a self-assessment that becomes the baseline for- Yeah. Thanks. Um, so, once the board has gotten clear about what the priorities are, then uh, exactly as Juan said, a large part of the work becomes how do we pivot everything we're doing to be in alignment with the community's vision and values as we've codified in our goals and guardrails? Because that's what the, the, the goals are, your way of um, identifying what is the highest priority set of the community's vision and your guardrails are your way of identifying what's the highest priority set of the community's values. And so once you've identified those, then the work becomes, how do we align everything that we do with the community's vision and values? That, that becomes the, the work of the board. And so part of what that looks like is you've got to be asking yourself the question, how do we evaluate our superintendent, as I mentioned? But before you evaluate your superintendent, you always need to self-evaluate. Uh, boards that self-evaluate appear to be more effective um, at creating the conditions for improved student outcomes than boards that do not self-evaluate. And so what our recommendation is, is that you always self-evaluate in the 30 to 45 day period prior to your annual evaluation of your superintendent. So if you're going to evaluate your superintendent in July, then you need to self-evaluate in June. You need to go into a conversation about how is our superintendent's performance fully grounded in how well did we perform? If we were trash this year as a governing body, that we shouldn't expect that our superintendent radically outperformed us. It is really hard for a superintendent to outperform our board. If we really handled our business as a board this year, then we can have a little bit more sturdy conversation about you know, the superintendent performance. And so how much grace you lend has something to do with how have I performed. And so that's why you've always got to self-evaluate immediately before evaluating your superintendent. And so that's when in the year your annual board self-evaluation will happen. But as we're on our way there, our coaching is to do a quarterly self-evaluation where once a quarter you pull out the instrument in the manual and just do a quick check-in. The first time it's pretty hefty. It can take an hour or more depending on how well prepared the board members are. But after that, you know, it's normally a quick, when my board does it, it takes us about 15 minutes to conduct a self-evaluation. <clears throat> and the purpose of this is just to make sure that the board is growing in its trajectory. And some of the things that are in that evaluation are things you've already discussed. Have we actually adopted goals? Have we actually, do we actually use data in adopting those goals? So those goals actually about student outcomes. But it also lives in other things. Are we making time to go out and communicate with our community? Are we using the goals and the guardrails to evaluate our superintendent and to evaluate our budget? So all of those type of behaviors, the pivots you know, that Juan described, all of those are actually built into uh, the instrument. And so the instrument then just exists to say, have you actually made these pivots yet? And, and you won't make all of them all at once. We generally suggest that it takes boards about two years to go from zero points on the instrument to 80 or above. And so this is not a sprint. This is, in fact, a marathon. But part of uh, my role in your lives is to help constantly uh, be nudging such that you are moving in the direction of aligning all of your activities with your community's vision and values. That's what the instrument is for, and that's why we recommend self-evaluating on a quarterly basis, to just constantly be asking, are we actually changing our behavior, or are we just window dressing? And so if you're curious about what are a lot of the next steps, check out that instrument. Uh, it has things like how regularly are we having two-way authentic dialogue with the community. There are things that how regularly are we providing training for our community around what effective governance looks like and how they can best advocate for their uh, children and, and their well-being. It has things in there like, are we training future board members? If somebody gets on the board and they just learn about effective boardsmanship after they get on the board, y'all didn't do your job. Those folks really deserve to have some insight into what the job is before they actually have to sit in the seat, but the people have to make that happen. That's that's on y'all. And so all of these type of things are built into the instrument. It's just a way of gut checking. Are we actually changing our adult behaviors as a board to
to align with the student outcomes we want for our children. Thank you. Other uh, curiosities, other questions, uh, clarifications before we dive into the work. Uh, I think I've heard from three of you, so check in with the other three of you. Any questions or comments before we dive in? All right, I see a thumbs up. Good. Madam Chair is good. Maria, how you doing? All right. Well, then in that case, uh, let's dive into this. So probably the easiest way uh, to do this is using what I refer to as keep, delete, modify. And so I want to walk through each of the ideas. You have a document. It's a one pager that I uh, <clears throat> got from your superintendent. It has six potential goals listed uh, at the top. It's labeled draft. It has five potential uh, guardrails uh, at the bottom. And so what I would invite you to do is um, if you have access to that document or some uh, document that has all of your uh, potential goals and guardrails, what I want to do first is I want to do a quick gut check on each of them to figure out if you want to keep it deleted or modify it. And then only on the ones that you all really want to consider and give credence to, then we'll stop and ask your staff to do a little deeper dive of some of the homework. I don't want them to have to present on homework if you all aren't actually going to consider it. So <clears throat> first we'll figure out what you all want to consider and then we'll ask staff to help do some diving into some of this and provide some of the homework they've done. So do you all have that list of uh, draft goals and guardrails in front of you? Then let's look at uh, goal number one. This is grade three reading. The percentage of grade three students who demonstrate grade level or above performance on the state English language arts as back assessment will grow from 48% in June 2023 to 70% by June 2028. So here's my question for you. Do you want to keep this as one of your potential goals? Do you want to delete this as one of your potential goals? Or do you want to modify this as one of your potential goals? So if you like it exactly the way it is and you think it should be one of your you know, potentially three goals, but definitely no more than five, uh, then you would say keep it. If you don't think it should be one of your uh, three you know, to five goals, uh, then I would say delete it. If you think this has this has promise, but there's some things about it I'd change, then say modify. Uh, so we'll just go around the table right quick. Maybe just start with you know, Eric and go around. Um, you want to for this one, goal number one, and I'm trying to keep a tally myself here to keep track of all this. Though I'm sure staff is doing the same. So for goal number one, uh, would you want to keep it, delete it, or modify it? Uh, for me. This was actually one that, though I think it is um, in alignment with my values, has some overlaps to goal number five, so, or at least in the community's interest. And so this is actually one that I was willing to delete um, for a number of reasons. One, I didn't, well, though it does identify a certain demographic in students, right? And we're talking about students who are at grade level. I thought that that was also fairly broad in the description of such. Because I, th I think that from a community standpoint, a lot of the uh, community input that we've been receiving has clearly outlined a certain demographic, and we're talking about our English language learners or uh, our black students, our brown students uh, in particular. And this one was just broad. It was saying students at, uh, at grade level. And so though I do appreciate the goal, I thought that from a, um, let's call it from an aspiration standpoint, from a, a goal setting standpoint, I thought that uh, goal five did it a little bit stronger. So that's what my interest would be to leaning towards five and deleting this one. Gotcha. <clears throat> All right, folks. The benefit of going first is that the facilitator has probably done a horrible job of explaining the activity. So uh, thank you, uh, Eric, for um, offering your keep, delete, modify for goal number one. For everybody else, uh, the intention of this round is not to explain and deliberate, but just to figure out what are we going to actually spend the most time on. And so I'll just ask folks to you know, give me a keep, delete, modify um, for goal one and two, three, we'll do it in super rapid succession. That'll tell us what things we're actually going to spend time on and what things we're not. Uh, and 
because I suspect a couple things may fall out naturally. And then we'll come back and everybody will have opportunity to do a deep dive into um, your rationale for the, for the few, uh, whatever few items remain. Um, and so that, uh, uh, Juan, if you want to go next, and then we'll just go around the table, keep the lead modify for goal one, and then we'll start with Maria and goal two, and we'll go back the other direction, keep the lead modify, and we'll do that for all of our goals and guardrails, and then see if that, um, if there are some that fall away, and that will allow us to do a deeper dive into the ones that are still on the table. Juan, what do you got? Delete. Keep. And and I, I would say keep with the, I'd like an explanation, or I'd like the, the district to make the case about um, why for, uh, if we're at 48 now, why do we want to go to 70? Why do we think we can get there? And, uh, you know, what's the thinking behind the goal? So it, it applies generally to the numbers that we've come up with. So. Oh, yeah. Modify to drop grade three. All right, uh, goal two. Uh, Maria, you're up first. Modify and keep. Doug? Um, same point about how we arrived at the numbers that um, that we've got there, but I would um, uh, like to, um, I, I, would, I would keep it. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Modify. Okay. Delete. Okay. Delete. All right. Uh, go three, Eric, you're back up. Keep. Uh, qu quick question, uh, AJ. Yeah. So, when if we say keep, that doesn't mean that um, we don't have an opportunity to talk about it, right? No, that does not mean that. Okay, keep. Modify. Which, which one are we talking about now? Number three. Okay. Keep. 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 Maria. Modify. Uh, number four, Maria, back to you again. Keep and modify. So, uh, so modify. <laughs> well, keep it, but it's modifying. <laughs> All right. Doug, back to um, you on number four. Keep. Delete. Delete. And to confirm, this is goal number four, correct? Number four? Yeah. Uh, it was modify. Uh, number five. Keep. 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 Delete. Number six. Delete. Keep. 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 Delete. All right, guardrail number one, the first bullet. Oh, I'm sorry, keep. 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 Number two. Keep. Uh, delete. Keep. 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 Number three. Keep. 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 Delete. Keep. Four. Keep. 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 Modify. And modify. And number five. Modify. Keep. Keep. Uh, 
a modify. Keep. All right. Well, you all successfully said that you would like to have six goals and five guard rounds. So, bravo to you. Uh, so, <laughs> now that we've got that sorted out, let's um, let's start in some of the areas where we have um, a meaningful consensus uh, to proceed, uh, but where it sounds like we've got some work. So, first, let's step into goal number three. Um, so all of you essentially want to proceed with goal number three, um, but there is a conversation about some potential modifications. Um, and so let's uh, work through goal number three and then uh, we'll work through some of these other goals after we've worked through all the goals and we'll work through the guardrails. Um, so Madam Superintendent, uh, would you mind if your team shares the uh, homework you did on goal number three and why you recommend this particular, um, uh, these particular uh, numbers. So looking at goal number three, algebra proficiency, um, there's a backup slide that our board received last week, a set of slides referring to slide three. So I will kick off and then uh, Mr. Moskowitz may want to comment additionally. So looking at the percentage of students who meet the algebra A through G requirement, by the end of grade nine, growing from 68% to 80% by June 2028. And then looking at, Go ahead. Uh, looking at the percentage of black students who meet the algebra A through G requirement by the end of grade nine, growing from 64% in June 2023 to 80%. So in reference to that slide, um, there are some intricacies about when students take algebra. So we have many students that take algebra as eighth graders and meet the A through G requirement, and some who take algebra as freshmen. Those who take and pass algebra as eighth graders typically take geometry as ninth graders. So there's a lot of detail behind the way that this goal is set, but that we will move to thinking about eight out of 10 students without intervention will have passed algebra by the time they are ninth graders. So I don't know what degree of detail. If there's more detail that you'd like, Doug, feel, feel free to ask us any questions that you want to ask us. I understand the rationale now. Okay. Uh, is this the time to ask questions, AJ, for what the superintendent just shared? Absolutely. This is definitely your time to deliberate on uh, the potential for your goal number three. Um, so my questions, uh, Dr. Baker, and, and to the team, actually, it's just one question. Um, so if you could provide just a little bit more information or context to um, the 80%, obviously wanting something that's achievable, but also something that's bold and courageous. Um, if you broke it out by the five-year period, um, we're really looking at a 3% on average uh, increase. So just want to hear more about how we landed at 80%. And then I want to point to the same slide that you pointed to, given that with our previous indicator, we made a significant uh, increase in this. So how do, how do we sort of determine what's the balance between something that's achievable uh, but also wanting to be bold, uh, right? And, and if I'm thinking about it without having the context, 3% uh, on average year growth a year may not seem bold uh, enough, mm -hmm. uh, right? So just yeah. more, more about yeah. that. I invite Brian into the conversation. Please, yes. So there, there's a lot of research that shows with quality core instruction in any subject that we would expect about 80%, 80 to 85% of students to be able to be proficient with that quality core instruction. <laughs> We know that there are some students who may not, in that first um, round, if you will, that first attempt, they may need some additional supports, additional intervention. And so this is not to say that only 80% of, of high school students would pass algebra, but if they're not able to pass it in ninth grade, um, again, that 80 to 85% kind of research-based level for tier one uh, expectations, then we would be prepared to offer some of the intervention simultaneously that we do offer. And, and we do offer intervention simultaneous to tier one at times, but that's really a research-based metric around quality core instruction should be um, 
if it's done well and if it's done right, we should be able to reach about 80 to 85% of students. And I'll make a connection to something that you'll hear a recommendation, just because it's in my mind, something you're going to hear tonight from CAC, set of recommendations around multi-tier systems of support. So what Brian just shared in that 80 to 85% range, there's actually, as was stated, a lot of research you can imagine a pyramid. The bottom of that pyramid is quality core instruction that results in 80 to 85 percent of me they're meeting our goals for grade level performance like this without outside of classroom intervention in addition students who don't achieve it in an mtss system there's a tier two level where students receive things like small group tutoring other kinds of intervention and then in some cases when you move up that mtss system you have students that receive individualized supports and in this in the Mo the highest need situation, students receive special education services when you think about multi-tier systems of support. So this goal, not just from a metrics, but it also builds on, and you can remember a number of presentations where Dr. Lund shared about our shift to accelerated math across middle schools and taking a system-wide approach to accelerate math. That results in many students meeting that algebra requirement by eighth grade. And actually about half of our students as ninth graders take geometry. So this is bridging the, the meet in eighth grade and the meet in ninth grade for most students as has been described. So thank you. Uh, so that makes sense to me from a all students approach um, where I have reservations about the, the uh, and I don't have reservations about the percentage. I have the reservations about the percentage out of context. So as an example, Brian, you said 80 to 85%. Well, is it 85 or 80, right? Because if it's 80, and, and we're talking about a specific subgroup of students here, um, that could mean different things if our highest performing subgroup of students is at between 85 and 90, uh, right? So. Um, I, I do have reservations that um, if our students do get to 80%, if we achieve this goal, does that eliminate or diminish our equity gap across student subgroups if our highest performing subgroup is at 88%? Uh, so we do right, they do great as well, but we still have a significant disparity in terms of who's completing uh, algebra by the ninth grade. So. Um, if it, and and this is my this is why I um, voted to delete other uh, goals because here we are calling out a specific subgroup and to me the context still is either significantly diminishing and or eliminating the equity gaps. And you can see um, in both goals two and three right, that we had set 80% as the target. So that's kind of the context you're talking about. The other thing I would say, and, and this, is, this is hard sometimes, especially when we're, you're gonna be out communicating with the public, whether we put 80% or 82% or 85% five years out, it, right now we don't know exactly where, we might be at 88%, which would be great, right? So what we're trying to do is, you, you reference it, what is attainable, but also somewhat provocative and pushing our system. And what that, what that number ultimately is that the board decides, I think there is some room to say, is it 80 or 82? But going from the research around that quality, quality core instruction, tier one instruction, there's a lot of research that shows that 80 to 85% range is appropriate around quality core instruction tier one. Um, but, but I think that was, that was a lot of conversation that we had, even in the research department. What is an appropriate metric? And I think there's, there's a lot of room for discussion about what that number should be. Um, Dr. Benitez, um, to your point about focusing on one subgroup, I believe if we adopted goal three, that would incorporate goal two and goal four, goal four because um, once you're focusing on one subgroup, I think that will benefit all students. And also, I, I like the idea of goal three because I think goal two is kind of implicated in goal three. So I don't need to have goal two because I know goal three will um, address that and maybe even to a certain extent, goal four. 
Dr. Benitez, if it gives you a greater context, I go back to just what is the current A to C rate amongst our eighth graders that are taking algebra. So those are the students that stay on track for A to G, if you had an A to C in that course. What percent of students are actually in algebra? So last year it was 66% of our students were in algebra, this year it's 75%. So as we're gradually increasing the number of students that are in algebra, and you equate that to a pass rate of 76% at A to C, you can basically start to calculate where that 80 to 85% range can fall. More students that pass in eighth grade, the less students that have to take it in ninth grade. The pass rate in ninth grade is 53%. These are students that obviously were struggling in math, that were normally in math eight going into high school. Uh, math is not probably their favorite subject um, and have historically struggled in the ninth grade algebra course. So it would be a combination of let's increase the eighth grade pass rate at the same time, decreasing the students that have to take it in ninth grade, and then hopefully increasing the A to C rate in ninth grade as well, if that helps kind of break it down across the two grade levels. Yeah, and Mr. Miller was clearly trying to uh, get our students this morning to say math was my hardest uh, subject. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, Mr. Otto, did you have Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is a, a naive question, but so do you, uh, is the decision to take uh, algebra in eighth grade um, up to the student and his family, or is that a, uh, because I can see differential um, things happening if something, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that, I don't want, I don't want to take that, and it's going to affect your outcomes, and I just don't know any data or whether that's how those decisions are made. Um, generally speaking, it goes back to that math six grade accelerated participation. If you were in math six accelerated and move up the continuum, you would go into math seven accelerated, and then the logical sequence would be into algebra. We do have on occasion parents whose students were in math seven accelerated that shared some concerns depending on how they did in math seven accelerated. So if I was in math seven accelerated and I struggled, then perhaps there would be those individual conversations about whether to put your child in algebra in eighth grade or to wait till high school. On the contrary, it would be we will have we have some students that are in math seven that can actually jump up into algebra. So we have guidelines for schools to use. Um, generally speaking, if you had an A or B in math seven and you met or exceeded on the SBAC in grade seven, you would be recommended for algebra. And once again, these are guidelines that we create for our site, counselors and principals to support parents in that decision. Mm -hmm. Generally, I would say our parents defer to us to you know, place their students, but on occasion there are concerns and it requires an individual conversation to really decide what's best for the student. Mm -hmm. If I could just add one more piece of context to this specific goal that I think will apply to others, but I think since we're starting with this first one, um, when we think about algebra proficiency in ninth grade, students that are meeting or passing algebra by ninth grade in 2028, those numbers. We're actually thinking about some of our current fifth graders or sixth graders, right? And so it also implicates teachers earlier on. It's not just up to the ninth grade teacher to figure it out in five years, but how do we get more fifth graders proficient going into middle school so that they can confidently be in accelerated sixth grade math? so that they can pass and move on to seventh and eighth. So th this is one of those goals that looks like we're talking about one thing, but the leading indicators for that will actually be tracking down into, uh, even into elementary schools as we think about future um, math proficiency. Oh, and, and maybe this gets us off track a little bit. Um, I see that happening with goal four, because if, if we increase the percentage of um, ninth graders taking algebra and passing algebra, then we don't need to worry about um, goal four as much. But I'm but I'm assuming that algebra is kind of a gatekeeper to the A through G requirements, and so I don't know if somebody can um, share if that's the case or not. 
So goal four is a much broader goal than just math. It is it is looking at the oh, entire set of A through G right. eligible courses. Math is one part of it, and right. algebra is definitely an important aspect. You, you have to pass algebra. And if you well, I'm, I'm wondering if algebra is something that keeps students out of meeting that A through G and and I didn't ask that ahead of time, so I know we No, that's have okay. That. Um, there are different ways to answer the question. So last year we presented a report that actually gave an indication that English was and history were courses that were actually get, but there's a whole story to that and some hypotheses about that, which really is around students dropping courses or at the senior level just deciding that they've already made a decision about their post um, high school career. And if you're not going to directly to a CSU or UC, then you don't have to meet A through G. And once you've made that decision, the grade, in some cases, it becomes less important. So there's there's mm -hmm. more to the story, but I'll say algebra is a gatekeeper, especially to advanced math and to um, college majors that are STEM oriented. So below the surface of thinking about algebra are also wanting our students to be ready for majors and career in STEM. And so mm -hmm. there's, again, right. story beyond the actual, the metrics that you're looking at. Right, um, Dr. Benitez. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring the question back, but rephrase it. So if, if, if a community value that we wanna uphold through these goals is equity, and um, specifically eliminating equity gaps. And goal two, uh, I can, if I'm deducing this correctly, says that we'll increase from all students at 68% to 80. And goal three is we'll go from 64 to 80. My deduction here is that there's a 4% difference right now from all students to our black students. So my concern or my reservation is if we hit our target for black students, but all is at 86 or 87 or 88, we've actually increased the gap between black student performance and all students. So that's, that's my reservation, just rephrasing it, right? That, that without some modification to this goal, it could be that we achieve this goal for black students, but if right now there's a 4% difference or variance, it could also be that in five years, there may be an eight or 9% difference in variance. So that's where I'm coming at. Yeah, did, that, did that make more sense, me rephrasing it It that makes way? sense. Yeah. And actually, I'm just gonna call in AJ to comment on that because we're setting a goal that at some point may need to be yeah. revisited. And so that my, um, I'll say what I bring into that is that's also the purpose of a monitoring calendar is that you're constantly asking outcome focused questions and then potentially revisiting your interim goals or your board goals on an annual basis. So, but looking to you, AJ. Yeah, I was, um, I'd just come off mute right before you said that um, to try to jump into the conversation. So is, <clears throat> so as a board, as you were trying to make this type of decision, a few things to consider. And then um, as an aside, uh, I can't see everybody on the dais all at once right now. And so I don't know if all the board members have spoken on uh, this particular goal. If not, I definitely want to intentionally call out uh, anyone who has it to make sure that you get a voice in on this conversation. Um, so as you're trying to make decisions like the one that you're lifting up right now, uh, here are a few things that I consider. One, um, you, it is the case that it is meaningfully different to say we are, we want this to be true for all students versus we want this to be true for a particular group of students. And the board does need to make the decision which of those that you want to lean into. Uh, do not expect that if you say we want to focus on uh, all of our students for this particular goal, don't expect that the superintendent is then going to bring you uh, masterfully disaggregated data for every individual student group. That is not what you should expect. What you should expect is she's going to bring you what you asked for. And so if what you ask for is information about all students, then you should expect that. 
And what you ask for is information about a particular student group, then you should expect that. Uh, further, my coaching is going to consistently be set five-year goals and pursue them doggedly for five years. They'll come back and say, hey, every year, let's go, let's go this direction now, let's go that direction. Like actually give your system an opportunity to make changes, to recalibrate, redesign itself, to be in alignment with the community's vision. Um, and so once you make a decision, the intention is you are going to live with this for the duration of the goals. Um, what will happen is the superintendent will bring you some interim goals to say, here are the things that I think are most predictive of whether or not we're likely to accomplish this goal. And so there will be some additional metrics that she is choosing that just like you choose the goals, she chooses the interim goals. Uh, so there will be some additional metrics, but her task with those metrics isn't to try to give you insights to the other areas that you are curious about. Her task with those metrics is to share with you data that is most predictive, that has the strongest correlation. And so if you pick all students, that's fine, but individual student groups are probably not, you shouldn't expect that those are going to have the highest correlation. So those probably aren't going to be your interim goals. So that, that would be nice if it worked out that way, but you shouldn't expect that it will. Because her job with the interim goals is to bring you the most predictive uh, measures that give you a sense of, are we likely to, to achieve the goal or not? And sometimes your student group data will give you that, but often it will not. And so the data will not be appropriate to be used as an interim goal. You will be monitoring each of these goals four times a year. So four times a year, these goals will come up and you will be doing a deep dive into those. And at a future date, I'll provide training on what that looks like. Um, but that deep dive will be specifically in the area that you all define as your goals. And so if you say we want to go around fourth grade math, don't expect a deep dive into fourth grade science just because they're probably related. Don't expect a deep dive into third grade math just because they're probably related. If you say you want to focus on fourth grade math, you should expect that you're going to be doing deep dives into fourth grade math. Is it possible that it would become more expansive than that? Sure, very likely, because a lot of these things are connected. But you shouldn't expect that. Set your goals saying these are the areas that we're going to choose to prioritize. It, what, it, the last piece on this is sometimes boards will say all, sometimes boards will say a particular student group. Typically, when boards say a particular student group, it's for one or two reasons. Either uh, they feel like focusing on this particular student group will create a powerful leverage. Like, and there's some type of evidence that superintendents provided said, if we win for this group, it's going to be this big impact for everybody. I think of one particular district that did this, where the superintendent ran the analysis and they figured out, even though African-American male students represent a total of 5% of our total student body, when we did the analysis, we found that wherever African-American males were succeeding, the rest of our students were succeeding wherever they were not succeeding the rest of our students were less likely to be successful and that if we where if we calibrate in ways that uplift african american students it's going to those strategies will work for everybody if we calibrate around all students those strategies might not work for everybody and so it just it, the board often adopts that type of a goal as a way of giving the administration a lens through which to operate that, that the board believes will lift up all children so that's one reason that boards often pick a goal that points at a particular student group rather than all. The other reason, obviously, is because there are concerns around equity that a board is trying to demonstrate an allegiance to with a particular goal. Saying, you know, this is a student group that we have historically missed, and so because we have historically failed this student group, we want this group lifted up um, and their needs met regardless of whether or not that has a huge leverage impact for everybody else. This isn't um, a district-wide improvement strategy. It is a specific student group equity strategy. So those are the two most common reasons that I see school boards pick specific student groups to set their goals around rather than saying all students. I think you all just, right now, this conversation is literally the time where you all decide which of those makes the most sense for us. We want specific student groups for achievement purposes, because we think that will have a domino effect. Do we want specific student groups for equity purposes? Because we've just historically under, 
uh, serve this particular student group or do we want uh, to pick all students because we think that will have the greatest impact for our school system. This is the conversation where you need to make that determination. Um, so I've heard from some board members, but I don't think we've heard from all board members. Are there any other board members that we haven't heard from who want to be heard on this topic? Um, and this is probably going to be the longest conversation we have. Um, and once you all land somewhere on this conversation, it's probably going to make it a lot easier to figure out where you land on several of these other ones as well. So that's why I'm feeling a little bit patient about how this is going. Are there any board members who haven't spoken on this one who would like to speak? Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on what you have already brought up in particular to a cliche saying that I've said multiple times in regards to the rising tide raising all boats. I think that um, uh, going back to the uh, specificity in our board goals will uh, ideally have a broader impact on the entire system. And so that's why my interest has been on specifying a certain demographic so that our with the knowledge that that will support the overall uplift of the district as a whole. And so um, to that, in support of that, it also helps us as a board directly identify the resources going towards that demographic. It makes it a whole lot easier for us to directly see from a budget standpoint, from a supportive services standpoint, the exact resource going to that um, uh, demographic or those efforts in particular, uh, therefore putting me in even a higher support of uh, board goals centered around specific groups and um, with all due respect, not a focus on a, the larger student body. So are you speaking in favor of goal three at the expense of goal two? I, I'm uh, so to be clear. I was a, a full keep on goal three, actually. So I had no modifications, and I was a delete goal two. Okay, uh, Miss Lopez. And I don't know if this is possible, but I like to see maybe goal two and three combined, where we um, have the students meet a three uh, G requirement by the end of ninth grade, and this is all students, but then obviously our uh, black students, um, I actually like to see 80% increase to 85%, but um, I would like to see, I, I would like to know if there's a way that we can combine goal two and three. Uh, and, and I'll um, respond to that question, no. Uh, that you want each goal to have one specific baseline, starting point, one specific target endpoint. Um, and so you don't want to have compound goals. We want to see for this population to move from here to here, for that population here to here, and that population there to there. We would say that's actually three separate goals. Um, and so uh, you all are now starting to get a sense of why I offered the preamble I did around how painful this process would be. Uh, that's because it is. It's always, always painful. Uh, to prioritize because by saying yes to some things, you are saying other things are not going to be one of our top uh, three or so priorities. And so this is hard work. I get that it's hard. I get that it's uncomfortable. Um, but my coaching to you would, you could pick both two and three if you wanted. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but then my coaching would be pick one more and then be done. Uh, but combining them uh, doesn't work. Now, on the upside, goal two encompasses goal three so th um, that is a kind of a sort of way of combining them is that the data inherent in goal three is uh, built into goal two but no having com compound goals is not the direction you all want to go uh, I, I refer to it as uh, you know, if you watched uh, the movie aladdin where the genie says no more wishing for extra wishes um I refer to having compound goals as trying to wish, you know, for more wishes. No, there, there are three wishes. Um, decide which ones they're going to be and make them count. Mr. Otto? Um, I'm kind of catatonic about this. It's so complicated. I don't know um, what's, what you're going to wind up with if you do this. I'm, I'm more inclined to... To, to like two for a variety of reasons, um, but uh, 
it, it, it's it's so complicated. I'm not sure that if you say this is what we're going to do, that things won't change between now and and the implementation of it. And uh, so I, I'm my, this is my Occam's razor. You know, this the simplest explanation that you can come up with uh, to achieve what you're trying to achieve instead of trying to slice and dice it. So, okay. Dr. Benitez. Yeah, so let me, let me try to uh, help here, and, and, and I apologize if I'm making this more complicated. I'm all good with focusing on our black students as a subgroup for this goal. My, my, my question, and, and, I, and, and if there isn't, there isn't an answer, then there isn't an answer. It's that black students can achieve this goal. I have confidence in our system. But that doesn't mean that we uphold the value around equity if our highest performing student subgroup grows at a faster rate than our black students. And right now, it's 4%. So if we went with the all student one, we could achieve the 80%, but that doesn't necessarily mean that black students would make these gains. However, if, if we just focus on black students, absent the equity anchor, it could be that all the other students grow at a faster rate than black students. So that's what I think this goal is missing, that it, 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 it's a target population that we've said we need to focus on and, and, and I'm good with the 80%, but the question is, if black students hit the 80% and all other students hit 87 or 88%, we've actually increased the inequity in terms of student achievement around A through G in the ninth grade. So that, that, that's a question. I don't have an answer for it. How do we reconcile doing right by black students uh, but, but, you know, it, and, and I'm, and I'm going to use it illustratively, Mr. Miller. I, I'm not good with all, you know, with tides raise all boats because some boats get raised higher than others. Mm -hmm. So even if we raise the black student boats, mm -hmm. if all the other boats go, if there was already a disparity and all the other boats increase at either the same rate or more, uh, then we've actually magnified the inequity between our black students and all other students or those highest performing students. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm all in on goal three, but how do we account for and reconcile our equity and excellence, yeah. value and vision? One, one perspective I might share, and I'm looking at our district goals, and we know that depending on where the, the board sets its goals, then we may need to make some refinements to our district goals, but in the absence of board goals, we have had district goals. In this year's district goals, we made a refinement even to the way that we were thinking about black student growth. So in our goal one that pertains to literacy and mathematics, part of the goal is black student academic growth will increase for black students. So the difference between black and non-black students achievement is reduced to zero. So there's additional precision, and I want to thank the research team for working, really working through the summer with me to really think about what is the ultimate goal is not just the acceleration. It, the ultimate goal is that there is no disparity between groups of students. So that could play that language, not in the moment, but that language could also be supportive of what you are talking about. Yeah, I do want to offer, um, because it's part of the strategic plan that we're working on as a staff that connects to the board's approved vision and core values, is this concept of targeted universalism. And many of you have heard us say it over and over again, but it is alive in talking about what we're talking about right now, which is when you focus your efforts very intentionally in funding, in programs, in practices, in monitoring, on your least, historically least successful group of students, it benefits all students. And so I appreciate what you're saying. The precision of what we're talking about is really important. Um, and there's, there is a body of research that we're using to inform our strategic plan around this. But perhaps that kind of language could be used to slightly modify the way that the goal is stated that would be helpful. So in um, the context of the goals that we are trying to uh, <clears throat> zero in on, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to get a sense of where we're standing. 
Um, so are you better with goal three than you are with goal two? I am not good with goal two. I deleted that one. I am good with okay. goal three, but with the modification that Dr. Baker just expressed. I mean, and we, I don't right. want to get into wordsmithing right now. Right. But I, but I would also say, Madam Chair, and because I don't want to, I don't want to go into that deep dive for every single goal. Right. That I would use the same logic and rationale for every one of the. Yeah. yeah. Next well, goals. Well, yeah. as as we're going through this process, I, I want to add my um, my choice in that I would choose goal three and i guess this is for aj who's keeping track i would choose goal three i would eliminate goal two and i would add that language for um <clears throat> eliminating any any kind of gap i think that would be most ideal so so th as far as i can see we have three of us for goal three and i'm not sure uh, Mr. Otto, would you be okay with goal three and eliminating goal two? If we and, and modifying goal three? Yes. Yes. Okay. And Ms. Lopez, would you be good with that, um, adopting goal three and el el with a modification and eliminating goal two? Yes. From the very beginning, I said with modifications, yes. O okay. So I think we can eliminate goal two. All right, so goal two had the least amount of consensus for it. Um, it was actually tied with goal four for the least amount of consensus. So what I'm hearing is a modified goal three. Will someone read the uh, proposed modification for goal three? Sure. So this is lifting from our district goals to incorporate something that is similar to black student academic growth will increase for black students. So the difference between black and non-black students' achievement is reduced to zero. So we would add that, we, we, we would keep the language in the goal, but adding that specificity, Dr. Baker. Mm -hmm. Precision, yeah. as you said. Uh, so three. in the spirit of trying to get to one clear metric, um, it might be useful to describe to say the percentage of our the percentage of Black African American students who meet the eighth through G requirement by the end of ninth grade will improve, such that the gap between African American students and all students will decline from whatever X it is right now in June of 2023 to zero by June of 2028. Yes. Does that work for folks? But, yeah. but still Can keeping the 80% as our target yeah. goal, right? That's not what I heard. Oh, where, is the rest, where are the rest of your students right now? Well, all yeah. are at 68 and black students are at 64. So we would have to eliminate the 4% yeah. disparity, but still reach the 80% overarching goal. Yeah. All right, let me spend some time thinking on this. Um, and yeah. I'll try to propose some language back to you. We've got goal three. The next high, the next highest consensus getter um, in our five. list is goal five. Yeah. I was a keep, so I'll go back to my colleagues on those who probably had a modification or were delete. I'd be curious. I'm a, I'm a keep on that one. It's a specific subgroup of students that are two or more levels below. Um, we know demographically who that is in terms of our subgroups. Uh, it's our highest needs uh, students, and it's consistent with our equity and excellence. So that, that one's a keep for me. There were four keeps and one delete. Ms. Lopez, you, I think you suggested delete. I did because I was looking at goal one with... Uh, uh, proficiency at grade level in reading so there I wanted to drop the grade three and just have students uh, read at grade level and so if they're reading at grade level that definitely takes care of students being behind two grade levels uh, 
I will um, also share that in AJ's coaching, as we were working on the metrics to bring back to you and the recommended goals, um, something about goal five, goals five and goal six that AJ asked or posed a question around is, if we are using iReady as the metric that associates with the board goal, what will be the interim goal metric? And that, would, that is a question mark for us. So in the way that um, if you're thinking about goal one and want to change something about which grade level we're focused on, we would likely be using, in, if it's a, a, in grades K through, or one through eight, okay, um, we would likely be using the metrics that right now are in goal five and goal six, well, goal five, to associate with goal one. That would be an interim indicator. iReady data would be an interim indicator to Goal one. So you kept goal one. Yeah, would be, uh, be iReady, yes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The other thing I would add, just when you think about goal one and five kind of together, because they they're obviously are linked, just you know, not to overcomplicate things, but you could achieve goal five by getting all students to one year below grade level without getting students to proficiency. Goal one is talking about increasing from 48 to 70 percent of students who are proficient readers by the, by third grade. The implication is that all students to go to go from 48 to, to 70, we're we're moving reading for a lot of students aligned with our kind of early reading initiative. Yeah. Just there, you have to be you know we, I think we have to be a little bit careful. Again, goal five, goal six could be met without having proficient readers or mathematicians. Obviously, that's not what we're going to be trying to do, but. Um, I guess that's what I would Yeah, add. Brian, can you also just share a little bit about why grade three to Ms. Lopez's question? Like, why would we pick grade three and talk a little bit about early reading initiative? Yeah, I mean, there, there is a lot of research that shows we really, by second or third grade, we need to have students reading proficiently in order to be proficient readers through middle school and high school. Um, we are, you, you saw the foundational reading skills assessment data earlier that Ms. Madrigal shared. Um, that is a huge effort of ours right now. We've trained all of our teachers this summer, all of our K-2 teachers in early reading instructional practices. We're following that up with uh, multiple days of face-to-face -face training this year around reading and how to be strong reading instructors. Um, so that is an initiative that we are deeply engaged in so that third grade being the first year that we have state aligned SBAC assessments, where there are no assessments in SBAC, for SBAC before third grade. So this is our first opportunity to truly assess on um, state standards that is a um, you know, vet, f fairly vetted assessment around those around those standards so that's why third grade it's also it's building on achievement through k2 with our early reading initiative and thinking of instead of getting into remediation but thinking about acceleration and not creating a gap that we know widens when students enter middle or high school so being preventative and ensuring that students read by the end of third grade so Am I correct in, um, in understanding that it would be uh, beneficial to have more kids reading by, age, uh, by grade three and that our goal five as written could become an interim goal to support goal one theoretically if we adopt goal one that 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 goal five would support goal one, that the more kids we have reading by third grade, the less kids we'd have behind one or even two grade levels. Yeah, so I think part of what you were sharing is that, yes, we would be using iReady assessments in grades one and two. We don't, we don't currently provide it to all kindergarten students, but we would be administering iReady in grades one and two as a leading indicator of are we making progress towards grade level standards in reading. So it, would be one, it could be an interim goal that we would set to monitor progress towards grade three reading proficiency. Okay, so, so we have a system in place to monitor that progress so that if we adopt goal one, that would be um, an easy goal to keep track of 
and that goal five would also support that. So we have assessments in place, I ready for first and second grade, and then um, an interim goal could include the instructions outlined in goal five. Yes, with some modifications. So currently goal five is inclusive of grades four through eight, and that was intentional coming from all that you were harvesting from your community and looking at our student outcome data. It was intentional because it's inclusive of middle school and middle school is an area where we've seen the least significant growth. We've had some incredible bright spots, but in terms of systematic growth. So the way this is written is inclusive and it actually is intended to measure a different goal. So I'm just saying that to be really transparent. This is, to the point of Ms. Lopez, this is measuring how many students are getting to grade level proficiency. It wouldn't be this exact same kind of monitoring that is written here currently. The interim goal for goal one would have to be refined to be continually providing, well, quarterly updates on getting towards grade level proficiency, different than decreasing the number of students that are two grade levels below. So they are measuring different things, and that's important to be really transparent about. Yeah, th thank you for that, Dr. Baker, because we're also talking about a different target population. How in the third grade would you be three grade levels below, uh, right, versus in the, th there's a different implication being in the eighth grade and being two or more grade levels below. So two target, two different target populations, two, just like you expressed. My, my, my reservation with goal one, and again, I'm, I'm gonna say this for all the goals, um, I'll take our three uh, populations that we've received data on. Our English learners, I'm talking about goal one here, our English learners, our black students, and our students with disabilities who represent a smaller percentage of our students in and of themselves could continue to be left behind if all other students gained or grew at a much faster rate, we could still achieve Goal three, the way it's currently wording, uh, worded, but not do right by our students with disabilities, English learners, and black students, right? Because they represent a smaller percentage of our students. Um, in addition to Dr. Baker, Baker's differentiation, we, we were measuring two different things and looking at two different students in goals five and six, precisely for the point, Dr. Baker, because we wanted to hit that middle school uh, student performance as well. So um, I, I would be a, against trying to modify by combining goals and rearticulate that goal one as it's currently worded doesn't get us to doing right by our highest needs students in in hypothetically it could but it's not explicit and with the precision that we talked about uh, in our previous conversation about the previous goal you could select both goals with different intents around literacy and around reading. So the, the first goal obviously represents this acceleration and not creating a gap and having very high quality reading instruction in the early grades that is by third grade, you are getting students to, to reading. And goal five, which is around acceleration. There is an element, I'll say there is an element of goal six, I'm jumping around a little bit, but there is an element of goal six that is embedded into, the, into goal three, which it sounds like there's a lot of strength around algebra. So you could more, if you're trying to eliminate, which AJ's guidance has been, you're eliminating, you could maintain one, three, and five, and be seeing reading all the way through, through eighth grade um, and algebra attainment by ninth grade. So just giving you kind of a perspective of all the monitoring that those three goals include, you know, not, not combining them, but having those three goals give you a, a strong perspective about where students are. What's left then is the monitoring of thinking about secondary in the ninth through 12th grades. So that doesn't give you a strong indicator beyond algebra in ninth through 12th grades. And that's why, um, and you can negotiate this with each other and with AJ, that's why goal four, which was only represented by one keep, um, is important. It also doesn't mean that, the dist that our district team won't be focusing on it. It's in our district goals. So very specifically, a district goal is, and schools are operating with this goal in mind, the percentage of graduates 
who are college and career ready, it is written very specifically in our district goals. Perhaps that is relieving of you that it is, you know, that your focus remains on those three, the two reading metrics and the algebra metric as your areas of focus. Thank you, Dr. Baker. There's also a lot of assumptions being made, um, and, I'm, and I'm making it, that if we do right by students grades one through eight, and then focus in on our subgroup of students, mm -hmm. that they should be A through G on track in grade mm -hmm. nine, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yeah. Uh, if, I mean, if we're gonna hit these goals, then these goals are gonna translate that when they enter high school, yeah. they're gonna come with better foundational mm -hmm. skills, more equipped, more confident, and if we still continue with the curriculum that in ninth grade, everyone's default A through G. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that, Dr. Baker. I appreciate the, <clears throat> uh, I appreciate the, the way that you bring the conversation back to doing right by um, the students that we've outlined in our excellence and equity policy. We, we always need to um, keep that in mind. I also appreciate the um, suggestion of having goal one and goal um, goal five as um, as kind of a um, continuation of reading and I see goal five as a safety net um, but complementary to goal one and to me um, literacy is so key to everything that we do and we heard from a middle school teacher here Mr. Waddles, and I think he said something about he goes to a book to find all answers, something to that effect, I don't know, it was early. But I like the suggestion of goal one and goal five as being complementary, and then of course we were all unanimous on goal three. That's kind of where I'm um, at right now. I don't know where what everybody else thinks. Um, Ms. Lopez? Did you have your light on? No. Oh, Mr. Otto. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> I'm. I'm. You, you, you want me? You want me to talk or turn my light off? <laughs> uh, I'm. 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 I'm thinking. I'm still thinking about it, but I'm inclined to go that way as well. Okay. So. One, three, and five. Um, Mr. Miller, do you want to weigh in on the one, three, and five? So, five was a keep for me, uh, and I liked it as is because of the subgroup that it approached, right? I've been transparent about that piece. Um, I guess my question to my colleagues who are inclined to one, three, and five, are you saying that one, three, and five only at the caveat that I'm, I'm willing to keep one only, I'm, I'm willing to have five only if we also keep one? Are, or are you saying, no, I'm all in on five, or you're saying, no, if we're, if I'm, with five, then it has to have one involved as well. For me, that's that's where I'm at. I, I think one and five are complementary. I see five as a safety met, a safety net, but I see how they could work in tandem, and I see how they need to be separate goals. But for me, that's the way it is, one and five together. Okay, um, Ms. Lopez, did you have an opinion on the 135? I think 135 are great, but I'm uh, probably unlike my colleagues, um, <clears throat> I also think goal four is super important. I think preparing our students for college and for careers is uh, critical, and I do believe that <clears throat> we should make it a goal to have our students meet the A through G requirement uh, at a higher level than 59%. I think, um, I think we all agree on the importance of having our students um, college and career ready. I, for me, having three goals would be the, um, 
would be the goal of, of our work today, limiting it or uh, keeping our, our scope to three goals. And so for, for me, that's why I would eliminate goal four, but also knowing that the district goals will encompass um, that uh, aspirational goal of having our kids um, college and career ready. So it'll be, um, it's, it's not, it's not as though because it's not a board goal that it's not going to happen. It's just that um, the board goals that we select today are things that we want to monitor as a board and that we want to see happen in five years. But the district goals will encompass that. So it will be, um, it will be a priority for the district. Right. I think that the district currently... Um has goals to have kids read at grade level. So I do know that that has to be a district goal. Um, and I think my reservations uh, with what we're doing is that this is going to reflect budget. It's going to reflect direction that the district's taking. And so, again, uh, on a personal level, I think that the college and career uh, ready is important. In addition to goal one, <laughs> I mean, I think all of these goals are critical. Right, uh, but certainly, I like to see our students not only uh, literate in uh, proficient in, in literacy and math, but also ready to uh, to go to college or to enter the um, go into a career after high school, and knowing that we've prepared them. So. I'm going to say the same thing. I'm broken record today. Goal four doesn't address our equity gaps. So we could come up with 70%. We come up with 60% on goal four, but it doesn't address that we would still potentially have a gap between our subgroup populations or amongst our subgroup population. Uh, so unless we... Um, significantly modify goal four, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't support it because um, we can achieve that, but that doesn't mean that our highest needs groups would um, gain or grow or complete a, or, or be eligible A through G at um, in accounting for the, the disparity. Do we have any data on hand right now on the disparity? Yeah, uh, and actually, um, oh, we have it yes, as a supporting it's, it's one of your That's supporting right. slides. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It is slide. It was actually, it, there's no subgroup data in the supporting okay. slides, but if you go to the data from this morning, it does show the yes. difference between our yeah. all group and our yeah. black African American subgroup. Yeah, I can tell so, you so, I, so I, I, I think, again, if we're, if we're using the equity and excellent approach, Goal four, as it's currently written, doesn't get to that. So and the, to answer your, oh, okay. go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. The, the current for this graduating 2023 yeah. class, the all A through G was 57%, uh -huh. and the black African American subgroup was 44%. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the all could increase, but not necessarily our black student achievement. Yeah. Um, do we have any other board members in favor of goal four? Uh, mine was with the model. Uh, so I was uh, a modify for goal four because I thought that there was an opportunity to identify a subgroup. And uh, I did, we didn't necessarily have that data directly on hand, but I do think that in alignment to the principles that we represent, right, in preparing our youth for their future careers, that would align with why we're in these roles. And so to have it as one of our goals to improve the amount of uh, young people that are eligible for such is important. But I just wanted to make sure that we identified one of our subgroups. We're talking about any of the groups that we've already referred to today um, with a heightened level of emphasis. I've, I've said that multiple times. Um, so that uh, in alignment to what Dr. Benitez has said, uh, it helps uh, in regards to the inequities that our system has um, operated under um, for many of years. Yeah, and just for clarification, I also think goal four needs some kind of uh, modification. 
do you want to do you want to suggest something different than has been shared or well I think that what Dr. Benitez has stated in terms of making sure that uh, in having any one of these goals um, that our subgroups are not uh, affected or that uh, gap widens mm -hmm. I think we need to add some language in there that would um, you know make sure make sure that we're addressing that uh, that potential gap so what, what I'm hearing is similar, well, it's similar to goal three that started around black and African-American students, um, adding similar language to that of the district goal so that the difference between black and non-black students, student achievement is reduced to zero. And I, I think I'm also hearing that we're focusing on black students who are currently the, the lowest performing subgroup relative to a through G that was shared this morning. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm sorry, are, are black students the lowest performing A through G eligibility group? Yeah, we'd have to verify. I mean, we yeah. could look that up yeah. to be certain. Um, we, we know it is definitely one of the yeah. lowest yeah. and that we know that we are sending our black students for a variety of reasons, so it would yes. make sense to continue with that. Right. But we could get the data on what, what right. is specifically yeah. the lowest. Right. And once again, uh, and I'm sorry to cut anyone no, off, good. but I wanted to go back to uh, slides that we saw. Man, this might have been March. This was with Dr. C. Brown, where he was showing us how quickly in our students' high school process within 10th grade, 11th grade, they were already ineligible for uh, meeting the A through G requirements. And my initial uh, proposal when we talked about this uh, college and career readiness uh, goal to begin with was about re reducing the amount of students who were ineligible by the 11th grade. I, I, the unfortunate truth is that we know we are going to continuously <coughs> Uh, strive for 100 percent but it's going to be a tough one to achieve but reducing the amount of students that were ineligible yeah. for and that A3G ineligible was that would be an interim goal by yeah. grade level so mm -hmm. as was shared today and previously the reason why we focused on ninth grade on monitoring in our district goals ninth grade and frankly I'll say we saw significant improvement was that that's a leading indicator to what you're saying and so an interim goal would be for us to be thinking about ninth grade and 10th grade in route to A through G completion. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And once again, if we're just talking this through, obviously it's workshop style, so some of this yeah. is uh, uh, a, a little clumsy to say the least uh, for me. Uh, the piece that I just don't recall from that data, but I'd, I'd be curious to see again if I had it in front of me, was if there was any specific subgroups in particular that, well, and I know we already already talked about it, that had the largest disparity between A through G. So I can remember on the chart, and it was like by the 10th grade, there were 70% of our students who were still eligible. I don't remember if we disaggregated that same demographic to see if there were subgroups within there that were had much lower performance etc so that's what I'd be curious about so I know that that's probably another leading indicator that would help us get to that number I just have my and I am concerned about using this also has like an all kind of feel to it and so that's my concern so I'm gonna ask AJ to help us out here because to me it seems like we are all unanimous on one three and five and possibly there's some support for four but can you address the I guess uh, ramifications for uh, what happens if we adopt four goals instead of three so what the evidence suggests is just the fewer goals you have, the greater your likelihood of accomplishing them. The more goals you have, the lower your likelihood of accomplishing them. It's a resource allocation. You are in a constrained resource environment. And so instead of dividing critical resources among three top priorities, you'd be dividing it among four. As a practical matter, that means there becomes a lower cap on how far you should expect 
how much growth you should be able to expect to have each year. The way to think about this, and I'd encourage you to think about this across all of them as you're trying to decide what should that target be, is to imagine what has been our average rate of growth over the last few years. So say in a given subject, we've grown by one percentage point per year. Uh, and when we ask our staff about it, how much did it cost us? Well, we invested $100,000 in targeted investments to get that 1% growth per year. Um, then what I would say to you all as a board, that if you then set a target that is giving you an average of three percentage uh, points of growth per year, that I would expect that you need to invest 3x the investment in order to get that. So from $100,000 a year to $300,000 a year. Um, if you wanted to 5x the rate of improvement that I would 5x the rate of investment, you know, and go to half a million dollars a year. This is not, you know, a perfect science. This is just a heuristic for thinking about uh, your priorities and their real world financial impacts. I, I share that as an answer to your question, uh, because the more, uh, the, the more goals that you adopt, essentially the more money that you are trying to spend in order to get all of those different things to move to the degree that you want them to move. So that's the challenge that you face is you are encumbering more and more of your resources that need to need to be redirected from where they're currently deployed into this particular area. And, and that is what will happen is you will need to stop spending money elsewhere, which probably means you know, you know, release positions in this part of the district um, and take that money and now hire positions in this part of the district. Instead of doing that in three areas, now you be doing that for four areas, or instead of doing it this much, you'd be doing it this much. And so what happens is organizations just run out of an appetite for that. And so instead of actually being effective, you just kind of run out of gas, run out of emotional energy, and you just stop pushing. And for me, that's the my likely assessment for why the more goals you have, the less likely you are to accomplish each of them. So do I think that there is a massive disruptive effect between three goals and four goals? No, um, but it does mean in reality that you will have the same amount of resources that is now being divided among four priorities instead of three. And I have a follow-up question. Do you think it's worth us pursuing that fourth goal when not all board members are supporting it? So I definitely would encourage you to try to figure out how do we reach a consensus. The more uh, that all of you are fired up about your goals on the front end, the easier it is for you to stay fired up about them on the back end when you actually have to make tough votes to reallocate resources around them. Uh, and so if there is a way to try to figure out how do we lose one on the front end, that makes everything easier. That being said, this is a democratic institution. Um, and so um, you are not obligated to wait for um, unanimity. Waiting for a majority or supermajority uh, is absolutely appropriate. Um, for, and this applies to all board votes. It is absolutely appropriate to debate, 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 and disagree all the way through this entire process. But once the board as a body adopts the goals, the expectation is that all five of you are standing behind whichever goal, set of goals the board has adopted. It does not work to say, well, those aren't goals that I support. Those are the goals that those people over there support. That is a great way to set up your entire school system for chaos and failure. Um, and so part of the challenge of being in a leadership role of this nature where it is a team leadership role rather than an individual leadership role, is there going to be times when uh, the board as a whole goes a different direction? When I was board chair as a nine-member board, I wish I was on a five-member board. Uh, on a nine-member board, even as board chair, there were plenty of times where it was an 8-1 vote and I was the one. <laughs> it actually happened a fair number of times. And the media would run up to me afterwards and say, hey, you, know, you you were the one voice reason. You, know, you voted against this. What do you want to say about you know, these other eight people who are going the wrong direction? And my response to the media every single time is the same. You know, I, I trust the voters of this community. And because I trust the voters of this community, because I believe in the people of this community and their wisdom, then I trust their elected representatives. I trust the wisdom of this board. They say, yeah, but don't you disagree? Oh, 
did you watch the video? Okay, then you already know how things went. You don't, I don't need to respond to that. The only thing I'm responding to now is on a go forward basis. I trust the voters, and so I trust the Muslim this board. And, and that would be the end of it. And they heard that enough that they stopped coming to me looking for drama. That is the discipline that you will have to adopt if for some reason you find yourselves not all five gig on the same page. But that is a hard thing to ask. Expecting folks to maintain a state of discipline indefinitely is a lot to ask, which is why I recommend to you your better bet is try to figure out how do we get to a place of, uh, how do we get a place uh, of consensus uh, before proceeding. Okay. Um, that being said, one of the things you need to know is I will need to step away uh, for a while. I, I don't know if you all are gonna have lunch. This might be a great time to do so. Um, and then uh, I will uh, come back. Thank you, AJ. Appreciate your support today and yeah. we'll be in touch relative to continued facilitation. We will be heading to lunch and then regular board meeting activities after that. And so we'll schedule you in for the next time that our board can be discussing their guardrails. Thank you, AJ. Yep. Okay. Um, well, did you have your lights on? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, the only point I was going to make, and I think it was supportive of uh, what AJ was saying for the number of goals, is that uh, the devil is always in the details in that, you know, the, we, if, we, if we, and I'm not going to tie it to any particular uh, recommended goal, but, you know, some will be more expensive than others. You know, we're, we're about to lose a bunch of federal funding, um, and will that differentially impact these different goals? Probably, you know, the, the Fed just decided today not to change interest rates, but to keep it open uh, till the end of the year because they may want to change their mind. And uh, so, how do you how do you make a decision about that? I I <clears throat> I think that uh, that the one, three, and five that I'm supporting uh, is is a good place to be, and there is coverage. For four, with the with the with the district goals, and uh, that's why I feel more comfortable doing that. Okay, I'd really like to leave this morning with consensus on three goals. That would be, I think, <laughs> I think the only way I'd I'd feel comfortable leaving this meeting, because I think it's achievable. So. Um, in order to get to a consensus, I need an idea of, of where we are. So it's, you know, um, <clears throat> so we can see if it's possible or not. So, um, Mr. Miller, wh where, where do you stand on that? Uh, obviously, I'm good with three. Uh, I'm good with five. Uh, I don't have any quorums against one outside of the lack of specificity and I was looking for some focus towards a certain subgroup with four with the potential of even increasing the uh, percentage of students so to answer the question one three four and five are still ones that I'm comfortable with, but there's some small modifications. So you're settled on four goals? Sure. Okay. Dr. Benitez? So again, presuming that we're going to have some preci precision language added to mm -hmm. modify um, the goals that we talked about, um, I'm, I'm good with three. Um, I'm good with five. Uh, and I would vote for one, if, if we were to take a vote, which we're not doing today, I would vote for number one only if we had consensus on five. I, I wouldn't vote for, for one if we didn't have five. Um, and so then that opens up a scenario for me that we would have two goals with a potential for a third goal, which is currently our goal four, if we didn't go uh, in the direction of one, three, and five. Here, here's, here's the thing. Um, 
goal four to me still, still has to be significantly modified, right? We've asked uh, the team to bring back, okay, well, what are our lowest performing in terms of this, uh, right? And, and then it, it, it's going to take more than just a, I'm, I'm good with it in principle mm -hmm. kind of conversation with me on goal four. And depending on what, who those subgroups are or, or what decision we make, then we then have to think about, well, do these percentages make sense uh, with those subgroups? So it, it, as it stands right now, again, I'm using the same rationale I've used earlier today. Uh, one, a little bit slightly over 1% growth per year over five years may make sense for an all, but I don't think that would make sense for a particular subgroup if we're talking about eliminating uh, equity uh, gap. So I, I, I don't want to hold up our process for multiple more meetings just on goal four mm -hmm. if that's the route that we're going to have to end up taking because that's not a modification. That's a si significant rewrite yeah. of goal four. I, I can tell you, Dr. Benitez, just to answer the question without getting into all of the data points below the surface, but our Pacific Islander and our African-American students, our Pacific Islander, represent a significantly different N size in number of students. They are have the lowest A through G completion rate, followed by African-American black students. So if you want just to, without getting way down in the details. And that's something that we have, that we have reported publicly. Yes, and, and so again, this, is, this to me is not a modify, it's a reconsideration mm -hmm. of what goal four is. So am I hearing you correctly in that the way goal four is written today, you would not be in favor of that? Correct. I'm solid on goal three, uh, solid on goal five, would only consider goal one if we voted for goal five. Okay. Okay. Um, so with that information, it sounds like we can eliminate goal two and goal six. Correct. Correct. Because I don't believe anybody's been uh, speaking out in support of goal two and goal six. So our sticking point, I believe, is goal, is goal four. For me, it's too broad. Um, I agree. It would have to be completely rewritten. I don't believe we can go forward with our work and this process that we've already invested three years in without having um, a working set of goals. Um, like AJ said, he, he recommended that we didn't adopt it today, but that it was um, a, a working template. And so for me, it has to be one, three, and five. But I'm hearing from Mr. Miller and Ms. Lopez that you're in favor of goal four. So my ask to you, because it's not going to be supported by the rest of the board today, that it would take a complete rewrite of goal four, would you be supportive if we landed on goals one, three, and five? I'd like to see goal four there. And so uh, we can uh, modify it as we've discussed, but I really feel strongly um, that we should keep goal four. I too firmly believe that a board goal centered around A through G completement, I mean completion or uh, satisfaction is something that we obviously ultimately represent, but I think it will be great to have some form of um, accountability to our board to that goal uh, if it was a part of our board goals. So can I ask both of them a question, Madam Chair? Yes. So if, 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 I, if, if, I, if I'm hearing correctly, we're talking about considerable modification to goal four, right? Not, not as it's currently written, correct? Yeah. Um, so if, if you are entertaining that would you entertain then that we uh, forego goal one in favor of goal four if it for, if goal four was modified to keep us at three goals? Yeah. 
From I would say yes, because if we're preparing our kids to take those A3G requirement, then the assumption we're is preparing that they're going to be, right? Yes. Right, okay. Just wanted to get a sense. But if we had a consensus for three, four, and five, we'd be accepting four without knowing what that final language is. Well, we're still waiting for data uh, back on, I mean, Dr. Baker gave us data on, I think it would be an outlier to yeah, try to do it Yeah, I think that, and, yeah. and goal three needs to be rewritten yeah. fully yeah. to come back to you. Yeah. So I heard, I've got really good notes about goal three. That precision would need to be, if you're swapping out yeah. goal four yeah. for goal one, yeah. then that same precision, including the acknowledgement of Pacific Islander students and African American yep. black and the reduction of the gap to zero would need to be included yep. in that goal in my okay. mind. Yep. So what I'm hearing is that we are unable to reach an agreement at this meeting that we can eliminate goals two and six, but that we need to have a follow-up meeting to consider um, goals one, three, four, and five. Yeah, with and a rewrite. So it, and, with a rewrite. Yeah, and a, and a little bit of clear data that's made public. Again, it, the data that I'm referring to is in our annual yeah. report, so it has been made public, but just for your okay. discussion to sync, sync okay. up Okay, so is that okay final. with everyone? Sounds good. All right. In which That's case, next meeting we will have it for you. Next meeting, I do want to. Okay. Uh, I do want to make a note that um, AJ talked about majority or supermajority relative to the the recommended guardrails. There were either three keeps, or four or five keeps. So there is majority for all of the guardrails that are proposed here. The highest being the first one. There were five keeps. The second and third, there were four keeps, and the fourth and fifth, there were three keeps. So that tells me that we're close. We're close. And so perhaps you can think about before the next meeting, and I can I can share that data with you, but points one and two, or point one was was unanimous. Two and three were a supermajority, as AJ used the term and the last two were majority. So perhaps you can think about whether you're going to approve all of those, or as AJ said, refine down to a few. And if you're looking at a few, the first three had the greatest um, consensus around them. Okay. So Jill, I'm sorry, so that's a five, four, four, three, three? Yes, okay, exactly. Okay, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so October 4th, what is our next? No, by heart, Wednesday, the 3rd or 4th is our next board meeting. Um, week prior, you'll have the backup data and the refined <coughs> goals to look at. Um, and we'll put it in a new business item so that you can establish a vote on the final goals and guardrails in the board meeting, okay? All right, anything that you'd like to leave me with? And I'll say me on behalf of AJ and me too, that you want to share about the process or that you want to say in closing. Uh, Dr. Baker, so you did um, share with AJ that we would be in, in touch with him. Is the plan that we would want AJ at our October 4th meeting to facilitate? I think so. He's right? been a yeah. really important yeah. part of this. So I, would, uh, well, I, I will would also agree. say if he's not available, then I think we should proceed yeah. on that date. Um, he may want to do some individual outreach to you all in anticipation of that day, but let's hope that he's available to zoom in as he did today. So I would, I, I totally support that. And again, if he's not available, I, I would require for us to at least have an opportunity to meet with AJ okay. between then, yeah. th now and then. That's good. I yeah. will. Yeah. Any other comments? No, I think we. Uh, have done everything we can do today yeah. and we will continue this discussion October 4th yeah yeah thank, thank you, you good everyone. work this morning yeah. All right. so we're adjourned for lunch